I'm Karen McNeil Miller, President and CEO of the Colorado Health Foundation, and welcome back to the afternoon of our health symposium. We had a powerful morning, so I hope you were there to be a part of it and to experience it. And remember what I told you this morning. Okay, now, so this afternoon, we're gonna start out with a, a funders panel. And that uh, advisory group that I told you about earlier, when we asked them, what do you think people wanna hear about as it relates to COVID, as we're, hopefully we thought we were coming out of COVID, and what they said was, well, I think people want to hear from funders. We haven't been able to see you. We haven't been near you. We haven't heard a lot from you. So we'd like to talk to funders. And so that's what we're going to do this afternoon. We're going to spend some time talking with some funders. And the questions and the session is actually going to be driven by you. I've got a starter question from everyone, but then we want you to type in the questions, the questions you would like to ask the six of us as our representative funders here in the state of Colorado. So get ready, use the question function, not the chat function, but the questions in, they're shooting those to me up here. Uh, hopefully we can, hopefully we get a lot of questions and we'll get in as many as we can. So I'm excited about this conversation, and let me introduce you to who we're going to be talking with this afternoon. So on the screen here, we've got Cass Wilkerson, uh, Cass Walker Harvey from the First Southwest Community Fund in Durango. How is it down there? How are you? Oh, uh, we're that's not too bad here, Cass. And then we've got Crystal Middlestat from the Chinook Fund. How are you today, Crystal? Excellent. And then on stage with me, I've got Carlos Martinez from the um, Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. Got Lauren Castile from the Women's Foundation of Colorado. And Dr. Ned Kalange from the Colorado Trust. So the six of us are going to be willing to answer your questions, whatever they are. So start typing them in. But let me start with this question for everyone. This is a conference that we're focusing on the intersections of COVID, health, race, racial justice. All mm -hmm. of us have been uh, f equity funders, social justice funders, racial justice funders for a while. First of all, why are you funding racial justice, social justice? And did COVID, um, change that, alter that, teach us anything, shift how you're doing your work. So I'm going to start with uh, Crystal, if I could. Great. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's great to be here. So I'm the executive director of Chinook Fund. I've been there since 2018. And formerly, I was a grantee leading queer and trans anti-violence organizing around the state. Um, I wanted to share that I come from a working class background in Oregon, and uh, I'd also identify as queer and non-binary and mixed race, Japanese and white, and I was the first in my family uh, to get a college degree, and these are experiences that are not common in philanthropy. Um, so at Chinook Fund, we were founded in 1987. Uh, we're a community foundation that seeds community-led systemic change by mobilizing resources for and trusting in social justice organizations across Colorado. Um, for us, racial justice has always been central to our work. Um, at this time, currently, over 80% of our board and staff identify as Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Um, and of those, uh, BIPOC-identified individuals, a third identify as Black or Indigenous. So that leadership is very important to us in our racial justice work and grant making. Uh, and last year, 86% of the organizations we funded across the state of Colorado were BIPOC-led, um, and of those organizations, a third were Black-led. Um, we distributed over $320,000 in grants, the most in our history, um, and some of that is, is thanks to the Colorado Health Foundation and your contributions. Um, I wanted to show that for us, the racial justice piece is also connected to our giving project model, which is how we do our grant making. So we convene members to do political education, relationship building, grant making, and grassroots fundraising. And it's really through that model that we've been able to sharpen our racial justice analysis and our practices. 
And I'm just sure that when you invite folks to this level of, in depth of political education, it opens you up personally and organizationally to different questions and conversations. And I think it has also forced us to be more accountable to our values and our mission. And that's definitely strengthened our racial justice work. Uh, what did COVID teach me and, and us? Um, many things. Um, COVID taught me that our grantees are oftentimes in the best position to provide mutual aid support and direct relief to communities hit hardest by the pandemic and the growing racial wealth divide. Uh, it taught me that our grantees were quick to pivot organizing efforts to make the most of unique openings for radical change, including bills passed for paid sick leave and police accountability last year. It taught me that Chinook Fund can play a much larger role in acting as a hub for organizing national and local foundations and major donor dollars to support Colorado's social justice ecosystem. And lastly, in response to COVID and uprisings for Black Lives, we partnered with ELC, Transformative Leadership Change, to launch the Another World Possible Fund. And that fund is a vehicle to invest in social justice organizations who are fighting for both just response to COVID-19 today and also a visionary future for our world in the long term. And we see this partnership as an example of movements of color collaborating and philanthropy being in deep partnership and in accountability to grassroots groups. Um, and then lastly, just some like logistical changes we've made. We've started to offer phone calls in lieu of written grant reports as an option for all of our grantees. And for our rapid response, Another World is Possible Fund, we created a simple Google form application um, and our grant making committee actually disperses those general operating grants every month. Um, and we do not have any reporting requirements. Um, so thank you so much for the thoughtful questions. I look forward to Thanks, Crystal. I'm gonna go now to Ned. Thanks, Karen. And um, thanks for inviting me, happy to be here. Uh, I like the question about why racial and social justice uh, as a starting point. Um, the Colorado Trust's 36-year mission has been to advance the health and well-being of the people of Colorado. And shortly after I, uh, I got to the Trust, uh, we worked on changing our vision to one of achieving health equity for all Coloradans. And as you start to think about health equity, it, it's so much more than access to health care. It, it's what we call the social determinants of health. And when you think about how long a person will live and how well they will live, it ends up these, these social determinants of health have way more impact than health care. And if we really wanted to make a change in health equity, we had to move into the social determinants of health. This is a long way of getting to what are included in there. And it's a complex relationship between things like education and income and housing um, and political clout. But one issue at the very base of it is, is systemic racism and racial justice. If you were going to try to find the common denominator that would move you the farthest in terms of improving the social determinants of health, it, it's going to come down to race and racial justice. And I think that's how we got there before COVID occurred. Uh, what the pandemic showed us is that we were definitely working in the right area, I believe. And we had worked hard in, in working directly in communities with resident-driven grant making to build uh, resident teams across the state and in communities who knew their community and knew who needed help and knew where the problems were when COVID hit. And so with that infrastructure, we were able to direct uh, the, the biggest majority of our overspend, which is spending beyond the 5%, which you know we, we followed your lead and many other uh, foundations. We focused that on these community partnerships who were able to distribute funds in response to COVID that matched up with the real need of those most impacted in the communities. So that was a major part of what we did, in addition to identifying other priorities um, that we felt other uh, foundations may have had their focus in other areas. I think uh, I like hearing about the, the grant approach. I think we just told communities we will fund what they 
think we should fund, and there weren't those reporting requirements. We really tried to make the flow of funds and the impact on communities um, as seamless and as easy as possible. And we found a lot of uh, partners. So, for example, in trying to increase access for students, um, who might not have access to computers and broadband, we partnered with people like the Kara Health Foundation in identifying potential communities and distribution strategies to help kids uh, continue with distance learning. Uh, and so those relationships and relationships with communities, uh, I think really help solidify our belief in kind of resident-driven place-based grant making. And we were well, I, I feel we were poised um, to have impact in response to COVID because of our strategies. Thank you. Cass, how about you? Yeah, thanks. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with you all today. Um, in terms of why we choose to address racial inequities, we come at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, so I run First Southwest Community Fund, which is a nonprofit 501c3. We're not a foundation. We are the partner nonprofit of um, First Southwest Bank, which is one of the two community development financial institutions in Colorado. Um, so we're, when we're talking about racial justice, we're really looking at the, the racial wealth gap. Um, that's, you know, we're pretty heavily focused on access to capital for small businesses and entrepreneurs in rural Colorado. Um, and I think a few things um, that we both have chosen to focus on and became even more relevant during COVID. There's a big misconception that rural Colorado is white. Um, we work in a number of communities where the majority of that county is BIPOC, um, you know, predominantly Latinx or Native. Uh, we do have small African-American and Asian-American communities. But there is this misconception that rural equals white, and that is not the case and something that I take the opportunity as a white British female to talk about when I'm on platforms like this, because I think it's really important to, to break down that stereotype. Um, the other piece is, you know, we know that our financial institutions are built on, honestly, white supremacy and racist systems um, that have prevented so many folks from accessing capital and being able to access wealth. And so by choosing to have a racial justice lens and focusing on racial inequities in our lane, which is small business um, and entrepreneurship, um, we're looking to create new systems that are, that are more equitable. One of the ways we did this last year, um, actually in partnership with the Colorado Trust and the Colorado Health Foundation, we launched a Rural Women-Led Business Fund, um, which is focusing on supporting women of color in rural Colorado, specifically in the San Luis Valley. Um, and again, as a white British female, I don't pretend to have the expertise um, that's needed to lead something like that. Um, so we hired an amazing program director, Azarel Madrigal Chase, um, and we have an incredible community advisory committee primarily made up of women of color, who we pay for their time. And I think that that's really important, um, Expecting, not expecting folks of color to do this work for free, um, especially when you know, our rural communities are small and many folks are asked over and over again, especially those who are kind of in more positions of power. Um, so what did COVID teach us? Honestly, um, I think it reemphasized a lot of things we already knew. We definitely saw in the small business space how inequities were perpetuated in so many ways because of how funding was, you know, being allocated, especially when it came to processes. Um, so one of the things we really tried to do was take out barriers um, for folks who maybe hadn't kept, you know, detailed records of every child they'd had coming through their family childcare business. You know, they hadn't maybe, because they'd been focused on providing that care, not the financials. Um, so really, you know, trying to make sure that those, that those funds were able to get to folks that really needed them. Um, and then I think, you know, it's probably preaching to the choir here, but listening to what communities need, um, you know, really focusing on not just the outcomes, but the processes um, and making sure that even when we're in a time where we have to make quick decisions, that we're taking the time to make sure that those decisions are inclusive. Um, that's where I've seen folks 
you know, when you're in a pressured situation and you have to make a decision, folks will often choose the easiest option, which unfortunately, because of how our society is, means that folks of color will get left out. And so even in a situation like COVID, where we had to make quick decisions on the ground, making sure we had the right people in the room from the start um, and making sure that those decisions were taken with the time they needed was really important. Thank you. Thank you, Cass. Lauren. Uh, thank you. I agree that I am honored to be here with all of you. And it's so interesting, the interconnections that exist between us. Uh, we have been partners with the Colorado Trust. We joined the Colorado Coalition for Immigrants and Refugees with the Latino Community Foundation some years ago. Um, we have also funded uh, CAS as a part of our Women's Impact Investing Giving Circle. And Crystal has been an advisor of ours on um, best practices for community-led uh, grant making. The Women's Foundation of Colorado was established in 1986 coming out of a um, perspective of the feminization of poverty. And at that time, there was a generalized understanding that women broadly um, were more inclined to live in poverty. Uh, over the course of the evolution of the Women's Foundation of Colorado, as we've had access to more and more data, been able to disaggregate the data, but even more importantly, developing deep relationships in community, with community, and learning with and from community as well. Uh, it's very clear that uh, the experiences, as Kimberly Crenshaw would say, some people get access to more access to the good stuff and other people get um, more of the bad stuff. And when one looks at communities of color and in particular the lives of women of color, um, having that intersectional lens is essential. We're aware of the fact that one cannot have gender equity without racial equity. That one cannot, in fact, elevate half of the population when significant uh, elements of the population, people within um, that group are being left out, treated differently due to systemic and historic practices, lack of access to opportunity. So starting about six and a half years ago, when we um, first kind of developed a new strategic plan, we dug deeply into community. We developed a uh, community-based grant-making uh, team uh, as a part of our committee. Um, we made a point of looking statewide for both rural and urban programs that would reach women um, across the state from an intersectional perspective. And then we began to require that our research, which is a hall, one of the hallmarks of our work, really um, become more disaggregated around gender and race and intersections of um, sexual orientation and ability and linguistic uh, experiences, country of origin, et cetera. And I get frustrated when we talk about disparities sometimes because I feel as though disparities blame um, others that if we in fact talk about systemic and historic um, racism and um, misogyny and xenophobia, then in fact the opportunity to having greater change increases dramatically. So we use public policy with a lens. This past year we supported a maternal health bill that was looking specifically at black maternal health and the outcomes um, for women and for babies. Uh, to Ned's point about social determinants of health, uh, it is clear, and we're grateful for the partnerships with uh, and the support of the Colorado Health Foundation in recognizing that our um, focus on gender, racial, and economic equity is in fact a social determinant um, of health and well-being for our communities. So what about COVID? COVID ripped the veil off of what we all ultimately knew, 
um, if one is at all present within the lives of not only philanthropy, but of community, if you have children in schools, um, if you are uh, going to the grocery store, whatever it might be, if you're trying to access food, it was readily apparent that those who were on the front lines of our healthcare systems um, were primarily in many instances doing some of the most difficult jobs, um, women of color. That those in our grocery stores when you were checking out were oftentimes women of color. Uh, that those who found themselves in uh, industries, whether it was transportation or hospitality, uh, throughout uh, the resort areas of our state that shut down. Uh, the women who were cleaning those hotels were women of color and oftentimes uh, refugees and immigrants who suddenly found themselves at home um, with children who did uh, who were doing remote learning. They didn't have access to childcare. Um, they also may have found themselves in a situation, as Ned mentioned earlier, about technology and their partnership um, with you. So thanks to the Colorado Health Foundation, we were able to jumpstart a Women and Families of Colorado Relief Fund, and many others uh, joined that lead, your leadership in helping us to establish that. The issues that came up uh, around women of color who were funded primarily statewide, BIPOC, um, women and families were housing, transportation, food, mental health, uh, were key critical uh, issues for our community. And these were the people, the women uh, and the family members who oftentimes were the glue um, to our communities as well. The last thing um, that happened that I'll mention now is that we had begun a conversation based on all of our work through our grant making, our research, our public policy. We had begun before the pandemic in early 2020 to identify um, how we might have a more strategic approach of supporting uh, women and girls of color. The Ms. Foundation released a, port, a report called Pocket Change, um, you know, women of color doing more with less. And of all the billions of dollars that go out in philanthropy, uh, only 0.5% nationally was going to women and girls of color. That was $5, or that is still $5.48 per capita for a woman and girl of color. So that report, our board um, took that information. We established the Women and Girls of Color Fund. Thank you, Crystal, for your advice and guidance on, on that as well. And um, we're focusing on the leaders. Um, we're focusing on the leaders. So I'm happy to talk about that more and what liberatory leadership means for us. But we're... Um, you know, in our grants, we are also setting aside money specifically for the leader, for self-care and for support, um, because we are um, burning the women out who oftentimes are the movement leaders, whether it's Me Too, whether it's Pride, or whether it's Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Carlos. Thank you, Karen. Um, the Latino Community Foundation was established 13 years ago, and it was established um, to really address the racial and social inequities that sometimes philanthropy doesn't address. Um, less than one, about 1.5% of all philanthropic funding goes to Latino communities. So that's kind of like why the Latino Community Foundation was established, to be able to address those inequities in philanthropy and to better support uh, Latino nonprofits. Um, and I think that's what really attracted me to the foundation. Um, this is my 32nd year in the nonprofit sector, and through those, you know, th uh, three plus decades, um, I've ran organizations uh, during the HIV/AIDS crisis, during welfare reform, as I put it, which was disastrous, uh, during 9/11, uh, the 2008, 2009, and I've seen how a lot of these crises impacted communities of color 
and then to see how these the systemic racism, systemic um, injustices, I have to say that, um, some of these cases, were put together to really prevent our communities from accessing and really thriving after crisis. And so for me, those experiences over the years really kind of like taught me how we were gonna address COVID as we came in, um, our foundation came into this last year. We're a non-endowed foundation, so we have to raise all our money for grant making, for operations and so forth. But within 10 days after like March 13th, we had a plan to our board that they approved right away that was a th three-tier strategy to address COVID and the strategy was developed in relationship and in conjunction with our community we right away told our staff we're gonna call our our grantees we're gonna get information from them and we're gonna see how we're gonna be able to go ahead and support them and we also knew that about 65% of our executive directors had been on the job four years or less they had never gone through a crisis and we're gonna need to be able to be supported through this process process as well. And so our three-tier strategy for COVID was addressing um, the executive director and supporting the executive director with, with skills, with support, mostly just support and, and listening to them. Um, the other piece was resources. Um, my experience has always been that after crisis, there's a lot of resources. But mostly uh, for the larger organizations or the larger nonprofits, and sometimes it excludes the smaller CBOs, uh, organizations of color. And so how do we help them access the resources that they need? And then lastly, to be able to provide resources for them so that they can go ahead and respond more effectively um, into their community. I think what, we've, what we, we didn't really change much of the way we do our work, but I would say that we evolved and we deepened the work that we did. Um, we're very committed to social, I mean, to um, language justice, and I think sometimes people don't realize all the work that goes into language justice, and I would have some foundations calling me and saying, oh, you know, do you know someone who can translate my application, you know, our application, you know, into different, into Spanish, because we, you know, we want to uh, do, um, bilingual applications and so forth. And so I would say, okay, well, are you gonna provide technical assistance in Spanish to help people fill out the application? Are you gonna be able to go ahead and you know, do uh, you know, things on your website to answer and questions in Spanish also? Will you be doing your reports later on in Spanish? And they would be like, oh, I didn't even think of any of that. And so uh, that was, you know, I think for us, just deepening that work. Another part that um, we did is that when we do our grant making, we also know that there's various communities where you may not have a nonprofit who is there to support the community, but you have trusted leaders. And so for us was how do we work with those trusted leaders to be able to go ahead and get support to these communities um, in a way that they're not having to wait for weeks for an application or they're not having to go through another uh, uh, town or community, especially in the rural areas, to be able to go ahead and get that support. Um, I think another thing that we really looked at was our reporting as well, and really not expecting everybody that um, to report in the same way, because um, not everybody has the same capacity. Um, and really looking at, in, at organizations and leaders more individually, as opposed to looking at them like <clears throat> one homogeneous group and saying <clears throat> how we're gonna go ahead and support them. And lastly, I think one of the things that for me, um, was really critical in this past year. Um, and I think sometimes we don't realize this. It's just kind of like that, as Lauren was talking about this at the end, um, about supporting the executive director, about supporting the leader. <clears throat> I remember throughout the AIDS crisis, 9-11, uh, um, this whole redoing of, of, of the welfare reform and the 2008-2009. What happens through a lot of these crises, unfortunately, is sometimes how the narrative changes on communities of color. And sometimes that narrative is not a great narrative. The HIV AIDS narrative that was put on and then put on with people of color was horrible. 
same thing um, with welfare reform. 9-11, all the anti-immigrant stuff that was coming through. And sometimes we don't take into consideration what an executive director, a leader is going through emotionally because they're the, living that lived experience that they're going through, their community is going through, their families are going through. And how do they go ahead and manage all that plus run an organization, fundraise, manage staff, deal with policies and raise money and do all of this and expect them not to burn out? And I think for us is really about how do we continue to support the leaders in our community the leaders today, the leaders tomorrow, and the leaders in the future, so that they have the resources and the tools and the skills, because they're the experts in their communities mm -hmm. to be able to address the issues, because they live them every day. Thank you, Carlos. I will just say very quickly, the reason we at the Colorado Health Foundation um, have adopted the, an equity lens and a racial justice lens, lens as, as, we, as we look at the data, where the deepest inequities are, there is this there is the centrality of race. So across all of the intersectionalities, if you if you are interested in women, the greatest um, the greatest inequities are amongst women of color. If you want to look at LGBTQ, greatest inequities are among LGBTQ of color. Seniors, disabled, children, greatest inequities are amongst people of color. That's why we focus on that. So now, you know, I had prepared some questions in case we didn't get any. <laughs> Let me, my, my iPad is blowing up. <laughs> so, and we will not have time to answer, to address them all. So my staff has been kind of grouping them. These, these are the ones that have been asked a lot. And we won't have time for everyone to respond. So we'll take a couple responses. And, you know, I used to, I grew up watching soap operas with my grandmother, what she would call her stories. And so the scene everybody was waiting to see was always at the end of the show. So that's what we're gonna do. Because if I ask you, what's the number one question you think we got? What's the number one thing on grantees' minds? Money. Money, <laughs> and what kind of money? General operating. General General operating. operating. So the number one asked question is essentially, why do you keep making funding programmatic when we need general operating support? Well, we aren't going to answer that until the end, so y'all can't go nowhere. <laughs> so now, we'll, we'll address some of the other questions. And again, we don't have time for everyone. So there are two questions that are closely re related. One is, so what are you foundations doing in your own organizations to promote equity, diversity, inclusion. And the second part of that is, and how can we hold you accountable? So let's, uh, let's uh, we'll get a couple of people that wanna, wanna respond on that. Either of those questions or both. Cass, are you trying to? All right, go ahead. We don't hear you yet. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's such a crucial question. Um, and I think that it's something that probably all of us, definitely our organization is continually working to improve. Um, so I think a number of folks have talked about this, but representation within your organization. Um, so we're a small organization. There's only three of us on staff. Two of us are folks of color. Um, I'm conscious that as the executive director, essentially we are a white-led organization. Um, so I do try and make sure that my two team members have every possible opportunity they have to be the ones speaking up you know, getting the professional development opportunities, being the ones making the decisions um, as much as possible. Um, that goes for our board as well. You know, we, we have a pretty diverse board. We always need to improve that. Um, the one piece I would really say is we lean really heavily on the decision-making processes, and that's where we have a number of community um, boards, committees, both on the loan side and on the grant side, um, and we make sure that those are representative of the communities that we're serving. So I mentioned the Rural Millet Business Fund. You know, we have 
seven members on the advisory committee, um, six of whom identify as women of color, on the loan committee where someone's actually making the decisions about whether folks get a loan, you know, that's 80%, again, women of color. And so we really try and make sure that that, that representation is present, especially in places where people are making decisions. Anyone else? Carlos. So a lot of our, our grant making is based upon um, what we hear back from our grantees. Um, so we, we have our grantee convenings. Um, and I think what we really learned also through COVID is that as our organizations try and pivot out of this crisis um, and try to rethink and reimagine what the new is going to be for them, is that this is a journey for them. And there's gonna be different steps around that journey where they're gonna need support. And we wanna be able to be there for them to provide them support, either through general operating support or through technical assistance or through connections or through other ways. And I think that's the one thing, I think with, with foundations also, it's not just thinking about the grant making piece, but other supports that our organizations need to be able to successfully um, you know, reimagine and rebuild their their um, their organizations to be able to to better uh, serve their communities, and I think that for us has been really key on on guiding that. I think internally also within our staff, you know, we try to have <clears throat> very diverse staff and diverse boards, people who bring lived experiences of what our community goes through, um, because they're the ones who understand what. Our community goes through and you know and as they learn about what it means to run an organization to how to support organizations it's then putting that together for them so you know I see it also as a place where people get to learn um, through their live and use their lived experiences to complement that learning to be able to go ahead and build stronger communities of color and I'll just say also on the for the Colorado Health Foundation our own internal equity journey has been um, extensive and, con and continues from simple things. It sounds simple, but it's very hard to do, of course. On the operations side of re, uh, completely overhauling our hiring practices, uh, our, our policies, the holidays we celebrate, um, the, uh, we, um, an equitable merit scale so that the folks who make the less, who make less than some of the senior execs, their opportunity for a raise is greater than the opportunity for a raise that I might have. The same with our benefits. So if you are uh, one of the lower paid staff in the organization, the organization picks up a greater cost of your health insurance than if, you, than if you're me. So we've had that. And we've also internally are doing a lot of, uh, of our own understanding of the the origins and the perpetuation of white supremacist systems. We have affinity groups, uh, racial affinity groups that we st still operate. We, um, that, that's been painful at times, but there's been growth on the other end of that pain. We still have a lot more to do. So we want to hold ourselves accountable and we will also be uh, publishing later this year some public accountabilities that some commitments we're gonna make and that we will report to the community how we're, how we're doing on those. And we want people to hold us accountable, as I know you want folks to hold you accountable. Lauren, if you had something quickly to say. No, I think there's um, one other area and um, we share much of what you're describing and the Women's Foundation has always, I think, been perceived as a rich white women's organization and its history, our board is now um, more than 50% um, uh, people of color. But there's another arena where we've made a commitment that I think is worth highlighting and that is uh, around our investments. We do have an endowment and we have committed to 25% of our investment managers uh, will be diverse managers with explicitly calling out 10% being uh, a black, indigenous, Native American, Latinx, Asian, uh, Muslim, uh, other Middle Eastern descent as a part of our management of our investments as well. So when we think about wealth, we're also thinking about who controls the wealth um, and who makes decisions about um, that as well. Thank you. Crystal. 
Yeah, I really appreciate what's been shared already and just want to add that for us, it's been really important to approach this work as being practitioner. And so, you know, for, including myself, being willing to be changed in this work and be willing to connect to our own stories, our own stake in, in what we, you know, what we're here to do. I think for our giving project, we've really learned that many individuals across race, across class, deeply need to feel a sense of belonging. And I think increasingly in many social justice spaces, that can be really difficult because it can feel intimidating, it can feel hard when you don't know the language or the frameworks. And our Giving Project is, is a space where we try to recruit people from across the spectrum of sectors, professionally, age, race, class, um, and also political analysis. And as long as someone has the commitment and they're ready to take collective action, we will hold space and support them on that journey and also support them in, in holding each other accountable and supporting each other. And I, I think that it's just important that we don't get stuck on like trying to become an expert and doing it right and to recognize that we're going to continue to make mistakes as we continue to innovate and learn and deepen our work. Um, and for us, a lot of that has been around centering black liberation and indigenous sovereignty within our racial justice uh, framework, both in our board leadership, also in how we interpret our um, grant making criteria, who we're funding and who we're recruiting to be making uh, decisions about our grant dollars. Thank you. Ned, I think you're the, you're the best one to start with this next question, which is how can community leaders have a greater role in determining where philanthropic dollars go? One of the things I've really appreciated about philanthropy in, in Colorado over really the, la the past three years, and, and I think it's a, I like to think it's a movement nationwide, is the idea that uh, at, at least community engagement is a core element of any successful philanthropic strategy. So we've moved beyond the concept of we're very smart, people sitting in a marble building in downtown Denver deciding what's best for um, Alamosa, Colorado, or, or Craig, or Yuma, and instead realize that the experts are in the communities themselves. And so I, I've really uh, appreciated how so many foundations and philanthropies have moved towards the concept of we have to in, at least engage the leaders and the voice of the affected community in the areas where we're trying to do grant making. The phrase that came out of the differently abled community has always been nothing about us without us. I think taking that philosophy into co-designing, co-leading, and actually yielding power and decision making to community leaders is the secret of successful distribution of grant dollars in the communities we're trying to serve. And that's what kind of underlies our resident-driven grant-making philosophy. Anyone else want to comment on that? I think just for me, call me. Um, you know, I think, you know, as I run with a lot of folks, or it's like a given my number, my cell number, call me if you have ideas, call me if you have different ideas. But the thing is, staying, I say that because it's all about staying in connection, you know, um, and engage with them. And I think it's really, it's really important when a CEO of a foundation makes themselves accessible and reaches out to them. I had, I'll just share a little quick story, which I thought was so cute. I was having a, a meeting with someone um, virtually and um, we started off the conversation and, and she said, you know, at the end, I said, do you have any questions or anything? She goes, you know what? I don't know why I was so nervous about talking to you. She goes, I changed three times today. And then finally I said to myself, well, all you're going to see is my head. So it doesn't really matter, you know, <laughs> what I'm wearing. But, you know, I say that because I think sometimes as uh, CEOs of foundation, people think that we're not approachable. And we are. At least I am. You know, and it's like, if you have ideas or something, call me. Um, we're here to serve you. You know, to that point, though, I would uh, reference an experience that we had when we established the Women and Girls of Color Fund. And we have 20 
community leaders around the state, um, all women of color and non-binary people of color uh, who make those decisions. It's not me, it's not my staff. Um, we also do the video conversations, et cetera. But in one of our early meetings, uh, the question about the power and the distribution of the money, because they have full decision making. They're not um, people who come out of philanthropic backgrounds in any way. Um, for the most part, uh, there are a couple of exceptions who've had some engagement. And we had to talk about the anxiety they came with that. We had to talk about um, feeling as though they deserved or had the right. Like all of the history of the, of the shame that we have put on um, women of color who are managing and making a way out of no way every day, every single day, just having to manage resources, um, suddenly in a philanthropic sphere, got anxious. We had to break that down. Um, and, and I am excited by the decisions they've made thus far from the rural communities. Look forward to the decisions that will be coming um, from the front range applications. But they had to name it in order to break through it. I, I just have to add, because as you were talking, and I was thinking about the question, community leaders, I, I wanna make sure that we realize that um, we need to be developing mm -hmm. those informal community leaders. So uh, when I think about community leaders, I, I don't think about who we usually think about community leaders. I think about giving voice and power to people who haven't had it. And, and that's what you're really talking about. And so thinking about our commitment and using strategies that lift up the leadership that is inherent in every community and in so many people that are otherwise uh, disconnected is just so key to being successful in changing that dynamic and building power in the, in the groups of people we wanna build power for, with. I'm sorry, power with. That's, that's right. So there's an, another question that I'm gonna take, start with the response, and then I wanna get your reactions to my response, and then if you have anything else to add. So one of the questions is, um, COVID and racial and social justice are important and deserve funding. However, I'm finding that funds for other ongoing programs are suffering from funds being redirected. How are you keeping up with the ongoing nonprofit operational capital and programmatic services to you know, those non-racial and social justice organizations? So my response to that is, uh, I, I, t I actually take some exception to the question because I'm at a loss for what program couldn't be viewed from a racial or social justice lens. Um, so if you are, you know, I think, you know, I'm an old early childhood educator. I think kindergarten teachers are social justice warriors. If you view it through that lens, you can have that kind of impact. So I, I'm, I'm um, hard pressed to, to determine or, or articulate a body of work or community service that can't be viewed through and approached with a racial justice or, or social justice lens. And so then to me that means nobody is left out if they're approaching it through that lens. So I'd love to hear your reaction to that or if you'd answer that question differently. Crystal. I think just one thing I would share for how we approach that at Chinook Fund is we didn't reallocate any dollars. We raised new dollars for additional grant making and so our regular grant making with the same you know, kind of pools of money that are typically raised by our giving project cohorts continued. And in addition to that, we were able to raise almost three quarters of a million dollars in the first several months um, once COVID hit. So that's one way that we're ensuring that the general operating support continues and, you know, arts activism, healing justice work continues to be funded alongside with mutual aid organizing and other types of um, social justice work that, that we're supporting. Anyone else? You know, Karen, it's so um, 
interesting. We have always, uh, well, no, I shouldn't, I lied. <laughs> we have not always. Um, we began uh, several years ago focusing more on general operating support, but, um, and that is all that we will be doing moving forward. But one of the things when we talk about um, who we funded before and who might be left out, I'm wondering if there isn't a subtext to that question um, and whether that subtext is a part of a national conversation of if in fact um, we lift or redistribute or support communities of color, will other communities lose if we apply a racial equity lens? And when we think about uh, those that have been funded by us that could be led by um, white leaders um, supporting low-income women, back to our roots of the feminization of poverty, back to your point about if you cut the data, um, where you actually see in any community, um, those who have been the most forgotten and not supported have in fact been people of color. So that's who our white leaders have been serving in organizations as well, in um, larger, more traditional, and, and effectively and with deep passion. Uh, Cass, certainly as she speaks here, represents um, that kind of leadership. So. Um, I don't think it's about what we lose. We forget sometimes in this conversation that what we're doing is that we are providing opportunity for the gifts, the talents, the joy, the resilience, the brilliance of communities from whom we have not been able to fully benefit to now shine. And we will continue to support programs that use an equitable lens through our income uh, funding, through our uh, women's impact investing circles. Uh, we will continue to support organizations that do that from the perspective of really knowing their communities, understanding the data, and who recognize those who have not heretofore been adequately funded. Mm -hmm. They've been underfunded and underinvested in um, for decades. So this is not about a short-term program. This is not about an initiative. Equity means that what we are doing is that we are now um, building that playing field <laughs> uh, and we've all seen the illustrations of what that might look like. Um, but ultimately, it's about um, who, who, in fact, at this point in time, will bring the greatest benefit to that dollar and to all of us through um, our giving. And <coughs> just, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Cass. I was just going to, yeah, I 100% agree. And... Honestly, my response to that question would be, it's about time. Like, when you look at the statistics of how much money in previous decades has gone to women of color and BIPOC-led organizations, whether you look at it in philanthropy space, as the statistics were shared earlier, like 0.5% was going to women of color. You look at venture capital, it's less than 2% going to women of color. You look at small business lending, it's less than 30% going to women. That's before you even get to women of color. And so... I guess my response would be, yeah, it's about time that more money was put into racial justice and leaders who are BIPOC and have the lived expertise to be able to address those issues. And I would say, like any other, like every leader of an organization that's watching, um, the six of us still have to make uh, decisions about the allocation of limited resources. The scope of our limits may be different, you know, 100 million or 100,000, but it's still a, f a limited resource in the sense that it's relative. And I also believe that it's, yes, for us, it is also making much more investment in BIPOC-led, BIPOC-centered, but it's mostly about who the organization is centering on. It's who the end recipient is. And as one of you just said, there are plenty of majority-led organizations whose predominant or major client group or service group are people of color. We're interested in making sure that those services uh, are equitable in those communities. All right, let me see if I can, I lost my place. So next question. Um, 
there was one somewhere about, oh, there was one that said there's little to no accountability for large funders. How are you accountable to the people you serve? You know, again, we are data driven. So our COVID um, relief fund, um, not only did we get 105 grants out in a month, general operating unrestricted statewide, but a month after that, we did ask for a brief survey because we wanted people to know who got that money, how, what the needs of the communities were. It was not an analysis, it was a learning opportunity um, for us. I think we can certainly do better. There's a lot of conversation now um, within community foundations and donor advised funds and um, you know how much is spent and et cetera. But I think um, sometimes we get a little bit twisted about um, the accountability is not only about the money, because it, it's not just getting money out the door, it's not about the quantitative, it's also about authenticity, it's about qualitative, it's about relationship, it's about impact, and by having people on our grant making committee, on our uh, investment committee, on our audit and finance committee, that are also really diverse um, in many ways in terms of their expertise by doing annual reports, having annual meetings, by having open um, opportunities for people to send us questions or to challenge us in public forums. Um, I, that's a beginning. Is it enough? I don't know. Um, but I think uh, philanthropy writ large has had a wake-up call and is exploring, um, and I think genuinely exploring, new ways to answer that question. I I've always, I always want to ask the counter question, which, what does you mean by accountability? <laughs> um, because I, I rarely hear what that means, and it may mean something different to everyone who answers it. Um, I, I tell my staff, this isn't our money, because it, it's not. The endowment that the Colorado Trust um, manages belongs to the people of Colorado. And, and our job is to try to do better than if we just gave every Coloradan $100, which would wipe out our endowment. Um, and so can we be wise in terms of putting decision making in the hands of communities and others to do better than just $100 per each person? The way that we've approached accountability is we have large investments in evaluation. Everything we do, we evaluate. We put the stories out to both be accountable to our, our board, but also to the people who are participating in our grant programs. So we can see the impacts that we have. And our evaluations, I will tell you, are both the good and the bad. And so we wanna strive to learn from what didn't work and strive to do better the next time. And then finally, I think we, we strive to not say the Colorado Trust did this, because we didn't. In, in our community partnership strategy, the community does the good and has the impact. And so to make sure we lift up their stories and concentrate on what they've done and their successes, uh, through our communication strategies and our, our newsletters and our other issues. We're, we're gonna hopefully move into videography and other uh, media to lift up those stories. I think that's a level of a accountability that I, I hope is tangible and recognizes that it's not us doing it. We're accountable to the people that we're working with in communities to make uh, their community more equitable. We hold the public trust, that's the first thing. Either Cass, I don't know if Cass, uh, uh, go ahead, Christine. Um, I just wanted to share that for Shinnefani on our 34 year history, we've always had community control of our grant making resources. And for us being able to have that democratic process of previously having an activist led grant making committee since 2016, we now have a giving project with a more diverse group of volunteers. 
but I think I would, I really, you know, would like to have more folks within philanthropy and more foundations really moving in that direction of participatory grant making. So there is control of those resources, um, not just advisement. Um, and I really appreciate, Lauren, you know, you bringing investment to the, into the conversation. We also have a small endowment that was fundraised in the early 2000s, and we have community members, leaders, activists that also sit on that committee along with board members um, and myself that work with our, our managers to make sure that our investments are also in alignment with our mission. And I'm really excited that there are more foundations moving in that direction and publicly talking about that work. All right, thank you, Chris, Crystal. So before we run out of time, let's go back mm -hmm. to the big question about general operating support. And um, do we, what do we see for our own, our own foundations, general operating versus programmatic? And I think a broader question, what do we see across the field? I think for us, um, most of our grant making is capacity building. And, and that's what we focus on. Um, so it's not program, it's not really general operating, although we do some general operating support. We do very little program, hardly any. But it's mostly capacity building, because within nonprofits of color, we have seen that they have been very underfunded in building strong foundations for their organizations to be able to grow, to be able to build their leadership at the board level, at the staff level, and, um, and really be able to engage in that. We also kind of like see some of our funding as what we refer to as pre-capacity building, because sometimes if you don't, if you've never really gone through capacity building, you're like, well, what am I going to get myself into? And so it's like really preparing people for a journey to undergo capacity building. And so that's kind of like where we put a lot of our investments in, is in pre and pre-capacity building and capacity building. No one else? Ned. Ned. I think. Uh, Ned, Ned then Cass. Sorry, Cass. No, go ahead, Ned then Cass. Uh, we do almost no programmatic funding. So uh, our, our other uh, grant strategies, the, our largest other grant strategy beyond community partnerships is all general operating. Uh, the community partnerships, uh, if there's programmatic funding, it is not directed by the foundation. It is directed by the community. And so we embrace the concept of, of um, trust-based philanthropy, uh, the concept of the value of general operating um, and all of the uses that our grantees bring forward to that. And it's a dialogue that is, as you ask, it's going on in foundations across the country. And boards are wrestling with um, the issue of giving up that control and um, thinking about providing trust. There's a there's a book that was helpful to us in moving forward that was not written by people of color. And I still uh, tell you, it's a remarkable book called The New Power. And it's talking about taking that decision-making out of the boardroom and pushing it out to the people who really know what decisions need to be made and build power outside. And that the organization will be better at meeting its objectives, its mission, vision, and goals if it will um, uh, do power with uh, or give, you know, allow others to make those decisions. And I think that movement in philanthropy is still in nationwide a little nascent. <laughs> uh, and I, I think uh, I see a lot of bright signs that it will become the nature of, of philanthropy moving forward. I, be, I believe for us, we are, do, we do both um, programmatic and um, general operating support, more heavily programmatic at this time. And I, I think we are in transition into how we think about what constitutes impact and what the evidence of impact would be. So until we are clear about what we mean by impact we would seek from an organization, um, which might be different than how even the nonprofits themselves have thought about impact, uh, we will probably still stay about the mix we are now until we're really clear about what impact means in a community. 
and um, who has it and how we tell, and who's in the best position to tell us where the real impact is. Is it us, is it the grantee, is it the community? Anyone else want to answer that? Yeah, I was just going to offer a, a slightly different perspective. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're not a foundation. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, um, but we do make, you know, some grants. Pre-COVID, it was really in the technical assistance realm for small businesses. Um, with COVID, we did do a number of other grant programs as well. And I guess the two words that come to me are trust and flexibility. Um, and I say this both as someone who goes out seeking general operating grants and as someone who provides grants to businesses and investments and loans to businesses. Um, you know, people know what they need, um, especially in our rural communities. And I think trying to dictate to folks what they can and can't do with funding restricts people's creativity and ability to get the impact that we all want to see. Um, and so we try to be as flexible as we can with any funding source that we do, whether it's a loan or a grant, we try to make it you know, as wide as possible to make sure that people have that space to do the work. And then I think from the funding perspective, I've been, in, I've kind of sit in this middle space, so I've been really lucky to sit in on some of the Philanthropy Colorado conversations. And I think there's amazing conversations happening in the Colorado philanthropy space around trust and about how we need to trust folks that are leading those organizations to know what they need to do the work. You know, Karen, what I would add to that is uh, certainly trust-based trust -based philanthropy, participatory ph philanthropy. We love to make up words, yeah. right? Exactly. I mean, we're making up the word of the day. Yep. Collective impact, I could go on and on and on. But, you know, the bottom line is that it's about people. When we're talking about data, we're talking about people. When we're talking about programs, when we're talking about operating. Just as Cass said, yes, we are a, a community foundation, but we're also fundraising. Um, and the fact that we are grant recipients ourselves, I think serves us well that we are in that same hustle on occasion, not competing with our grantees, going to different sources. Um, what does it take to fill out that application? What did we need during COVID? We needed unrestricted dollars. I did not want us to be in a position where women were again being laid off, who had children, where our staff was vulnerable, um, the anxiety that we had around benefits, and we cut back. $300,000 at the very beginning of our budget in order to protect our ability to give out to others. So um, I, we are giving flexible, what we call flexible and holistic dollars um, as a part of our current um, grant opportunities uh, that just closed today, as a matter of fact, I think at noon. But not only to nonprofits, but also to women. So we are providing cash assistance. It's one of the things we learned out of our relief fund were how many organizations help to provide tires, diapers, things that SNAP does not support, like hot food, um, cash that help to keep people from being evicted, uh, whatever it might be. So we're trusting the women themselves. We're not only trusting the organizations, and the organizations get to decide in their communities what that cash assistance and what that holistic and flexible money might look like. We, we got a couple of questions, um, or several questions about, I, I don't even know the name of it, the, um, the ACE, proposed ACE Act of, of um, more accountability on donor advised funds. Mm -hmm. Any commentary on that? You know, this is a conversation. I've been around so long. <laughs> I guess I'll answer this. Um, many of us have. But when, when I began in philanthropy in late 89 or 90, um, I feel like that conversation was going on then. And certainly um, when I was at the Denver Foundation, I think back to the question of accountability, that it is essential that donor advised funds 
are in fact tools that support the community, that they are philanthropic vehicles. I'm not sure around the ACE Act and this percentage and, you know, it's 75% of the money and, you know, how one, in fact, uh, the administration of that isn't quite clear to me at this point in time. So I'm not going to address that specifically. But I can't think of any community foundation um, leader that doesn't believe that donor advised funds are a part of our um, tool chest and by cultivating philanthropy that we're doing good and that we need to make sure that they have the education, the awareness, um, the processes that help them to get the money out and the understanding of community issues that inspire and engage them to do so. No one should simply be hoarding money, which is a term that's sometimes used. You know, there are a lot of questions we're not going to get to, but there's uh, there's one more I want to get to. We won't have time for everyone. You know, the, the federal dollars that are coming into our state absolutely dwarf the money we have mm -hmm. at our disposal. How? What's our role, and how can we help um, get all of those federal dollars to the communities that need them, particularly BIPOC communities who historically and traditionally have not gotten their fair share of the funds. What's our role in helping make that make that happen? Let me first see if, if either Cass or Crystal want to comment on that. Um. I'll just say that I think there's such a phenomenal group of folks on this stage and just any of you being involved in that conversation, I think is crucial. Um, you know, we're definitely in the small business side, like watching this waterfall come down and I'm really worried about what it's gonna do in terms of perpetuating inequities in the state. Um, and I think that the right people need to be around the table from the beginning that um, will speak up for our communities of color and ensure that they aren't left out with this. Because I'm really worried that if this money is not handled well, that we could see um, really serious consequences. Mm -hmm. So I think getting involved, I guess, is what I would say. So Carlos is jumping again in, and then, then Ned, then we'll probably have to close out. So the biggest thing is advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. And if you want to know more, give me a call. We're work I'm working right now with a couple of other um, BIPOC leaders um, in meeting with the governor and with the legislature to see, have them allocate our, my goal is at least 50 million to nonprofits to be able to go and use for infrastructure building. Um, what um, you know, what I really point out is in the past year, it was our nonprofits who were the safety net in our community, and we need to make sure that that safety net just gets strengthened, doesn't weaken, and we have to ensure that we get some of those dollars into our organizations, into our communities, to go ahead and, and rebuild the way we need to. So please give me a call if you're interested. Uh, two, two areas that, that we both participated in and I would recommend for philanthropy to consider. And, and one is to assure engagement of the diversity in the communities, especially BIPOC uh, individuals. The, they, the entire community has to have not just a seat, but a voice at the table so that uh, you're doing it from advocacy. I was thinking in terms of participation and sharing decision making. And, uh, and there are a number of activities that using uh, community organizing techniques to bring that voice in and listen to the voice and lift it up in decision making around the use of those dollars is one thing um, I think foundations can do. The other is that um, there are a lot of organizations who are good at writing grants. and. Uh, and many of them are not uh, BIPOC-led or BIPOC-focused. And so we've uh, tried to reach out and provide grants to those we know would be eligible for dollars in, 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 uh, er in specific places to build infrastructure that would be equitably distributed. Uh, one of those areas for us has been uh, rural broadband. And so to make sure that there's community engagement of a diverse uh, group of people in the community and then the ability to turn that into a successful request for funding because none of these 
funds include planning dollars. Mm -hmm. They're just programmatic dollars. So we have to, I think, see the field with the ability to get folks asking and getting that money who can uh, apply it with that equity lens. And, and Ned, I've got a big note here. You mentioned a book earlier, and folks are asking what the book was. The, the, there are two authors, one I can never remember, Henry Timms, T-I-M-S, was the second author, and the title of the book is The New Power. The New Power, okay. So one of the things we're, we're hoping to do, and we hope you all will do as well, is on the advocacy side, um, try to, the systems that are distributing the money, not to let them um, go to the default setting. Because the default setting of how these, how these kind of federal dollars have been distributed across the state are very inequitable. The, a lot of the, the organizations that we care about and communities we care about aren't on the, don't know to check the website or aren't on the distribution list or the requirements for getting the money are so steep or that they don't have the capacity or the bandwidth to manage all the reporting. So we're really asking the governor's office and, and all, of the, all of the cabinet members and their departments to not be seduced back to the default setting, but to recreate their distribution systems and their distribution methodology. So we have run out of time, we are about 45 questions we didn't get to, but I will reiterate what Carlos said. Uh, believe it or not, we are not the boogeymen or the big bad wolves, so give us a call, ask your questions, and uh, continue pushing us on the things you need to push us on. And let me thank these five um, exceptional leaders for taking the time to be with us today. Everybody and welcome back. My name is Ryan Fu. You saw me a little bit earlier before, and you'll hear from me more in a second. But right now, I just want to respond to what just happened because I'm—I just want to say I'm a young person, really quickly, who runs a business and avoided the nonprofit sector because I was afraid these kinds of issues would never be confronted. So I want to take a moment to say thank you because I'm somebody who just who who touched some of what you guys addressed today, and I bailed. I got out and I figured I'm gonna go get my own money, you know? And this kind of talk is super impressive and lovely and thank you to everyone who is doing the work. It's real and it's great. Um, so, thank you and we're gonna do something kind of weird in a little bit. I hope it gets you all on your feet and it's very, very fun. I think we'd all agree that no matter what issue we're trying to tackle, a lot of what gets in the way is sort of the ways in which we are unable to confront those things in ourselves. So before I begin what I'm about to do, I wanna introduce someone who's very special to me. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a brilliant, lovely, sort of genius human being. Please enjoy this poem uh, by Franklin Cruz. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Franklin Cruz. Mi nombre es Franklin Cruz. Mi familia es de Chihuahua, Mexico. So um, this poem is titled, Love Yourself. On the days you are your own worst enemy, laugh loud, even if you do sound like a hyena. Sometimes it feels like the world is rushing you to succeed and asking you to adult as if anybody has any clear idea on how to actually adult. So when you still find yourself making less than the best choices, crack open a can of nostalgia, laugh at your most socially awkward moments like the time I was actually caught naked in front of family. Remember that stress and the struggle, the mountain that as you got older somehow grew into a prairie dog hole. Be the friend who's brave enough to jump in and strong enough to come out with you. Show yourself you love yourself enough to be unapologetically you, especially when the riots and the sirens come. The ones that arrive every single time you run out of money, hope, or the trust you sowed in a country. Be your own best friend, who saw you hatch from the egg, grow wings, fly straight up into the sun, roast your own skin and fall, be there when you are shish kebab by the prongs of fate and circumstance. Don't panic at your busted frame. Love yourself enough to rebuild yourself. Love yourself enough to get wild with yourself. Love yourself enough to reenact X-Men with yourself. Love yourself enough to cook naked for yourself. Love yourself like you could love your family. Show them how you can grow wings over and over again. Love yourself like you could love your 
your heroes, the ones who don't even know how great they are. Love yourself like you don't even know how great you are. Like everything that happens to you happens on purpose and nothing was a mistake. Not even the booby trap and the pitfall. Succeeding can be easy, but learning to love yourself along the way is why we need friends like ourselves. So be your own Justice League Unlimited. Soup into your own head or imagination and say all the stupid shit you want. Hell, say it out loud and then back yourself up. Be the kind of friend who will plot out a theoretical crime spree. Be the kind of friend who will let you uh, bust out at a nightclub. Be the kind of friend who would allow you to crash at their house if you ever lose your home or your heart or your way. Allow yourself to germinate the way that you're supposed to. Grow again like arboles de piñones. Water your own roots. Trim your own branches. Sculpt your own crown. Be the kind of friend you would end up marrying. The kind that would make you laugh over stupid things like waffles. And cry over nerdy things like Star Trek. And love you in all the right ways like forever wouldn't even be long enough. Love yourself like forever wouldn't even be long enough. Like even after you die, you would love your spirit wherever it ends up. Thank y'all. Yes, Franklin Clues, yes. Please applause if you're in here, applaud. Okay, I'm gonna have us do something a bit strange. I think it's easy to get bogged down in the sort of intellectual and philosophical nature of some of what we're trying to do here, but I'm gonna ask everybody to actually do something with me, okay? So find a seat or whatever it is you need and take out your phone. I want everyone to take your phone out, okay? Take out your phone and I want you to go to the camera app. Yes, behind me you see I'm, I've got some guinea pigs who will be joining me in this strange experiment. Take out your, your phone app, and I want you to set it somewhere and hit the reverse button so you can see yourself. And if you're at home and you don't have your phone or you're watching this on your phone, go grab a mirror or a picture of yourself and that'll do. And I want you to take a second and just place that object down in front of you. We're gonna return to it in a moment, okay? So my name is Ryan Fu. And I'm going to try and guide you through a kind of interesting thought experiment, okay? And that question that I sort of want to explore is how do you see yourself, okay? Because no matter what of these large and sort of giant issues we're trying to tackle, a lot of the folks at the heart of why things haven't changed are folks, and I think we can all take responsibility for us for this ourselves, are folks who haven't fully healed, right? They've got the phrase, hurt people, hurt people, and healed people, heal people. So I want us to do a little bit of exploration and inspiration. So open that camera and set it down, and I want you to do a couple of things. First, make sure the camera can like see you, so that when, I'm gonna have you close your eyes in a second, but for now, and you can hold it if you want, I won't have your, your eyes closed for long, just make sure you can open your eyes to your own reflection, okay? All right, here we go. First, everyone go ahead and just close your eyes. Close your eyes, take a moment. It's been long, you've been looking at a screen for a while, We've been lived in this strange year where it seems like screen time is most of our life. So take just one second before we begin and breathe. Our lives are so busy, it's easy to get caught up. So I want you to erase the day for a moment and imagine you just woke up, all right? You're just waking up in your bed. You're getting out whatever stretch you do that's unique to you. You do that, you get out of bed. Maybe you make your bed, maybe you don't. You go to start brushing your teeth in the morning or flossing, maybe you've got very good oral hygiene. And you look up into the mirror and you're going to see something you've never seen before. Now in this world, it turns out actually you don't look like however you look like now. So right now in your mind, with your eyes closed, look up into the mirror, and I want you to just see someone who's not you, okay? Just imagine you're living someone else's life. Whoever came first to mind, maybe it's a parent or a friend or a business partner, you're just a different person for a second, okay? And you get all ready, you put on your dress or your suit or your tie or your scrubs or whatever it is that is this new person's life, and you go and you cook your breakfast, you get all ready, you open the door, you grab your purse or backpack, and you go and you get in the car. And you're gonna go out and meet your friend, okay? Now this friend you're about to meet is someone you care very deeply about, 
All right? There's someone you want to be successful. You believe in them. They're so talented. They've got so much to offer the world. And I want you to get in your car, drive to the coffee shop, open the door, walk out of your car, go and order your favorite coffee for you and your friend, and hey, coincidence, it's the same coffee. You both have the same interests. You go, you sit at the coffee table, and guess who's waiting for you? Open your eyes. It's this person. And I want you to take a moment as if you were not really this human being and take a look at this person like they weren't you. Go ahead, look around, move your face, take a look at that face, take a, as if you were a painter trying to create a lifelike depiction of this human being. Just take this face in as some art for a moment. Look at the eyes and the mouth and the nose. Make sure that you're really taking them in. And now I want you to imagine, like really genuinely imagine, what if you just, this was your best friend. This was somebody you love so much. Uh, someone else may come to mind, but just transfer that love onto this face for a second. And I want you to want the best for them. Take a moment to imagine what they're good at. What they like their zone of genius is, right? The place where they could have no script and no titles and no money and they would kill it. I want you to take a moment to imagine what their dreams are and how they're totally going to achieve them. I want you to take a moment to honor everything they've been through, that they've done to get to this very moment to come and sit and have coffee with you. I want you to love that person. And I'll be honest with you, most of us not. Most of us have a mind that is constantly telling us what's wrong, that we're too fat or thin or strong or weak, that we're too this or that or not enough this or that or the wrong this or that or need to be a different this or that. But the truth is that you're perfect. And when it comes to having faith, to reflecting and reinventing who we are, to giving out philanthropy dollars and really believing in people, we better make sure we believe in ourselves and that we can walk the walk and trust people to do a basic exercise like this, think, feel, and sort of like, you know, decide what they need on their own to get better, to do better, to ask for what they need. So you can go ahead and set your phone down for a second, but say goodbye to this person. Tell them you love them. Do that. Why don't you say, I love you. Thank you for being here. Say, I appreciate you. Say, you're beautiful. It's so stupid we don't say these things to ourselves all the time. I know it seems arrogant. It's not. We, we need it. So tell that person whatever they need. I, I'm going to give you 15 seconds of silence. Tell your person whatever they need. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for doing something weird with me. We're about to move on to a panel. I hope that was a nice little palate cleanser. I appreciate you. You're doing the good work. Thank you for what you do. Uh, the next panel is the Path Forward Community Driven Solutions. They're gonna be talking about how to actually fix stuff, y'all. I love this conference. I appreciate you and we'll see you in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. 
Um, we are headed into our final panel discussion for the day, which I think is going to be a really good one and a really powerful one. Um, every, every year at the symposium, we get a request to hear more uh, from communities across Colorado and what's happening on the ground, what's working, and this is that panel. So I'm very excited to be with you all this afternoon and to moderate this panel of three community experts, community leaders, to talk about the path forward and community-driven solutions. So today, I am joined by Annie Go Van Dan, who's the Executive Director of the Colorado Asian Culture and Education Network, Ricardo Perez, who's the Executive Director of the Hispanic Affairs Project, and Thomas Allen, here with us on the stage. He's the Data Manager for the Honoring Fatherhood Program at the Denver Indian Center. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us. We are actually going to start, before we ask the panelists to introduce themselves a little bit further, with a polling question for you all. This question is, since COVID, has your organization implemented new policies that address racial inequities? So we're going to give you all a few seconds to respond to that polling question before we turn to our panelists to hear from them. But a few more seconds here. Any word on how quickly we might have results? All right, we're going to go ahead and move on. We'll come back and share the results. Oh, there we go. Um, all right, so it is looking like we have a uh, a majority for sure who have, um, looking close to 70, 70 percent, 70 plus percent um, have implemented policies to address racial inequality. So really helpful. Um, you know, this morning we heard from Dr. Janetta Cole talking about the triple pandemic. She talked about the health pandemic of COVID-19, of course, the economic crisis faced in our communities, and then, of course, racial injustice, perhaps the most entrenched pandemic of racial injustice, the most entrenched pa pandemic of all. Um, I'd love to start uh, hearing from our panelists about the intersection of those three pandemics in the communities in which you work and what you experienced over the last 17, 18 months with regard to the triple pandemic that communities experienced. And Annie, um, can we start with you? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'm Annie Van Dan, and I have been active in the Asian community for over a decade. Part of it was because my mom and I started Asian Avenue Magazine in 2006, so have been very active in um, just wanting to have a good pulse on everything going on in my community. So this last year with COVID, when the pandemic first started in March um, 2019, there was a lot of fear, um, even within our own community, around how people were, were getting COVID. So thinking like really back in the beginning when we didn't know anything about it, and this really hurt a lot of our Asian businesses because right away people were experiencing discrimination. And so at the onset of the pandemic, we already saw a decrease for a lot of our Asian businesses and restaurants. Um, there was even like an anonymous person that was trolling Asian restaurants in, in the Colorado area and saying, oh, I got COVID here because, look, they serve this, and he was posting, like, a photo of a bat and just really spreading that misinformation. So seeing that right when the pandemic started and how much it's escalated um, from then to now because people are still um, not they don't, we don't totally understand the virus. And so one is just those impacts of, you know, racism that our community is facing because of our, um, you know, the connection to the virus starting in China. And obviously we know too, because of the, the rhetoric around the virus and how Asian Americans um, are, are kind of getting the brunt of that. And that includes you know, Asians that are not Chinese. And so I think what we've experienced is how we're really just lumped together as foreigners 
Um, even though Asian Americans have been in this country since the 1850s, we are still considered, you know, um, foreigners to this land. And so we have people that have been here, for, you know, they're, they're fourth, fifth generation. They they don't speak their language even, or they're, you know, they're mixed race now, biracial. And yet they will still get comments like, you know, go back to your own country or, you know, where are you from? And so there's just been this elevated level of fear in our community. So so especially, I will say, for like the seniors in our community who are not only feeling isolated, but also just those impacts and that additional burden of the racism. You know, they don't want to go out. They're worried about what they might experience on the streets or even just going to get groceries. And so really, um, our community has had this extra layer of um fear and anxiety and stress, there's been a lot more uh, people seeking mental health in our community when typically in the past, it actually wasn't really something we talked about. And there's a lot of stigma around mental health, but we're just seeing a huge increase in a lot of the um, kind of trauma we're experiencing with the pandemic. Mm. Ricardo, tell us about what the experience has been on the Western Slope. Yeah, thank you so much for this invitation. It's very important for for me to participate, and thanks to the Colorado Health Foundation for having this uh, important symposium to come together. Uh, um, yes, I am Ricardo Perez, working with the Hispanic Affairs Project in Western Colorado. Uh, this is a very rural America. It's a very conservative region. And I am working in this organization created in 2005 by immigrants, first generation, um, eh, who start coming to Colorado from Mexico mainly after 1994, are the children of NAFTA. Um, so this, we had a, a population of immigrants who is very spread out, working um, in the agriculture, construction, services, resorts. Um, we have over 20, right now, 21% of the population here are immigrants, mainly Latinos or Hispanic. Um, so when the pandemic came, uh, the last year was a very challenging for everyone. The, we as organization, we were anticipating in the very beginning that the, the pandemic, the COVID came at home. We were anticipating that um, uh, many challenge for the immigrant community mainly because we are very, the immigrant community is very isolated in this region is until today. So we start uh, trying to uh, planning immediately in the very beginning how to respond. Um, in, in March 26, we create the Western Colorado Immigrants Relief Fund because um, at the time with the federal government was talking about to send uh, financial sub cash assistance for everyone. Uh, of course, the immigrants and document people who is a very large community here, we know that they were very impacted. Uh, single moms, single mothers or um, workers start uh, losing the job. Uh, so we have two uh, scenarios here, people losing the job immediately and other people requested because are essential workers to stay at home and to be exposed working with others and to be more exposed to the, the pandemic, to the COVID. So this, uh, we were trying to figure out how we can support the community. Another, another situation was um, we were trying to coordinate, to collaborate with other organizations here, but especially we put more attention in coordinating with the uh, local governments, with the county, uh, because the health and human services are playing an important role, are part of our local government. So we start trying to uh, connecting with them in order to support the, the, our immigrant community. Was uh, very interesting in the, in the beginning for our local governments that they start spreading, uh, sharing information about the COVID prevention guidelines from the government. But they forgot uh, uh, working with the Latino community, with the Spanish-speaking community. So we came, uh, we come together with the, our local government to ensure that our immigrant community, Spanish-speaking, was receiving the information on time. So it was a very interesting experience and trying to figure out how to respond in this in this time, in this moment. Um, 
Of course, the the inequality was uh, just over there in the, from the, in the very beginning. Uh, uh, we've. Um, uh, I would like to mention something uh, uh, important for us. We, as organizations, frequently we have collecting data, but the most important data for us, including for myself, even I am the executive director. I am trying to be in communication with families, with the community, and I am spending every week hours with families understanding what is going on in the community. So um, the best data, we had, uh, we had the best data already for us because we, were, we, we know, okay, this will impact our community in that way, and we need to be prepared how to respond it. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, was in the very beginning of the pandemia, and we were accommodating our few resources, economic, uh, our financial resources uh, to serve and to be more strategic supporting our immigrant community in Western Slope. Mm. Thank you, Ricardo. Thomas, how about for you? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yes, uh, being a Native American in our uh, specific community, uh, overall, we have distrust towards Emma, a lot of uh, government systems, um, and most of the Native organizations in Denver and Colorado, um, we thought about how, you know, some of the funding was going to reach us, and we were going to be the last ones probably to get any of the assistance from the government. And um, because of that, you know, we started to collaborate, um, you know, small organizations needing, you know, again, you know, uh, data. And so uh, me being a data manager, I put together a online, you know, uh, COVID um, survey for our community and, you know, got it out to as many people as we could, uh, cross collaborated across organizations so we could gather this data. Um, not only that, but the contact data to make sure that, you know, some of our community members, the most uh, vulnerable ones, especially the elders, um, that we we were able to track them and um, ask them, you know, um, are you able to go out and get food? If you're not, you know, the Denver Indian Center will be able to deliver a small food box to you in this time so you do not have to go out to the actual supermarkets. Um, you know, gathering this data um, was hard because we had to be collaborative across, you know, organizations and, you know, um, think about the logistics of, you know, who's going to be there, who's going to be out there doing this stuff gathering this data and also, you know, delivering the food boxes. So it was a great, great collaborative effort, not only uh, on the Denver side, but also we were thinking about, you know, native communities off, um, away from Denver, um, specifically people who were on these native communities and didn't want, you know, um, to be going back and forth uh, to raise the risk of, you know, transmission of COVID, and then also just dissemin dissemination of correct information. We at the Denver Indian Center collaborated with uh, Denver Indian Family Health Services to get vaccines out to our community. Uh, we had uh, numerous vaccine clinics at the Denver Indian Center. Uh, we did one actually uh, this week for youth specifically, um, and it's open not only to our Native American community, but to anybody who wanted a vaccine and anybody who was willing to, you know, get the vaccine. We were offering that to anybody. Um, we were offering, you know, uh, information to other um, organizations in Westwood, you know, saying, hey, uh, we're doing, a, um, you know, uh, an event uh, around vaccination. If you are interested in it, this is the kind of uh, logistics that go for this kind of event. Um, just that cross collaboration and sharing information was vital, not only for organizations, but other organizations seeing how, you um, how COVID had impacted everybody. You know, um, there may be key people in other organizations that may have it impacted and they didn't have that, you know, um, that way to get to, you know, the data or, you know, grant funding, any kind of, you know, resources out there. So again, we thought ahead of not only our uh, community, but also other communities, other BIPOC communities. Thank you. I think all three of you referred to trust, um, the trust that you have with your communities that you serve, um, and the challenges with trust of big systems, big governments um, within your communities. You know, 17, almost 18 months into this pandemic, that is unfortunately not over yet. What is that state of trust? Has it improved or has it worsened through the course of this pandemic? Ricardo, I'll pick on you to start us off with that one. Actually, this one was a great opportunity for us. Um, we need to select uh, our partners. During the pandemic, our uh, key partners 
um, our uh, local government, as I mentioned before. This is very important because, um, and very interesting, because in the, in the Western Slope, a very uh, conservative culture, many times people, public opinion say that the government is the problem, is part of the problem. Uh, for us, in the very beginning, is part of the solution. The, and this is, uh, I think, I, um, this is a call of attention for also for our nonprofit uh, industry or community here, is that um, we need to recognize that the government play a, plays a, um, a play a very important role in our communities, and they have a specific responsibility, responsibility and task. At the same time, the nonprofit, we are playing a specific responsibility and role in, in the communities. Many, uh, what uh, the government is not able to do, nonprofits are able to complement. Mm -hmm. So, in the very beginning with the pandemic, we try to uh, coordinate very well with the local government, recognizing that they were the leaders, the Helen Human Services. Um, so the, the local government, government counties and the state government with the hospital system, with the healthcare system, they had a very important role. So we came in support and to coordinate in order to be sure that minority groups, immigrants, are, have the same resources, the same access to the ser medical services. So uh, was very interesting, and this is about trust. At the same time, we were trying to coordinate with the, with the local government. Also, the local government identified, uh, we're looking for uh, what organizations are close in, these, in those counties we can work together to be sure that minority, uh, 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 minority groups receive the same support. So it was a, a very, let's, let's say, a very natural connection. And we are very happy that they approached to the Hispanic Affairs Project because we they know that we had a very large communication with the Spanish-speaking community in, in the Western Slope. And we have some capacity to reach out also those families living in, in the middle of the field, families living in the in, uh, farming, in the ranch, uh, in the mountain, in the desert. So it was very interesting experience, and we value that this uh, the, 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 uh, the capacity to, to, to connect and to expand our collaborations. And I think we are now, as a nonprofit, also in a better position in the way that we identify new strategies and new forms to work together in collaboration with our local government. Together with them, was uh, we had the clinics, the hospital, and until today, we are also collaborating with many other organizations uh, just with the same goal, to be sure that our immigrant my community Minority groups receive the supports they need in the same level like any other person is receiving in the local level. Mm. Thomas, you mentioned specifically um, the historical reasons that trust is so low within the Native American communities and government. What has the pandemic done with regard to um, the, the trust within your communities about within for systems, government, et cetera? We at the Indian Center uh, thought about that, you know, overall, uh, how to encompass, um, how to uh, package that to our community. Um, and we started early off with uh, having, you know, PPE uh, specific for our, you know, organizations and letting uh, people know that they could come to us for PPE as available. Um, but not only that, we also did a PSA showing, you know, that we all, three of the organizations um, supported, you know, wearing the mask. Uh, and we also, you know, made sure every staff member was um, informed and we communicated the correct facts, um, you know, CDC guidelines and what we were doing and also, you know, collaborating with other organizations saying, do you have the PPE? Do you need the plexiglass? Um, if not, you know, we can, we can uh, see what we can do with uh, what we have, um, you know, and showing that the community that, you know, we were organized, uh, we were um, together, we were, um, you know, um, doing the best we could um, for the community and collaborating. Um, and, you know, offering, you know, 
that trust from these organizations that represent, you know, our uh, respective communities, which is um, hard, again, because of, you know, the historical trauma. Um, so it was really important that, you know, we had direction and that, you know, we were side by side by state and county and federal and that we also, you know, um, thought about our community and um, showed that, hey, um, uh, we are just like you and we are just trying to do the best we can. And Thomas, we're getting asked that you lift that mic up a little bit more when you answer, just so everyone can hear your responses. Sure. Annie, how about for you, this issue of trust um, within the community, trust of systems and government, um, the state of the pandemic 18 months in, um, how does that look for your community? The distrust in our community often is a, due to the experience from the home country. So the Asian community is so diverse here. We represent more than 30 countries. And so some people have very different experiences. Um, you know, some came from war-torn countries. Um, some are here as refugees, some from communism. And so that does affect um, how a person, a family, can perceive um, their relationship with the government. Mm -hmm. And so locally, the government and local police departments, in regards to the racist attacks, have been very active and vocal in supporting our community. And so in addition to what we talked about before, just the fear of getting COVID, there's also this fear for our community to just be out. And so you know, when the Atlanta shooting happened, that was really um, just a huge, um, painful moment for our community. And so the government was really active as far as like showing support. So um, local elected officials came out to our community to show um, patronage for our businesses and to really understand what our small businesses are going through. The governor, Polis, he has signed a um, hate crime, a hate motivated crimes bill to better support um uh, victims of crimes that could be related to hate crimes, which is really difficult to um, persecute right now. And so uh, for our community, just seeing the support, I think we're really seeing a lot of allyship in a way that we hadn't really before. I mean, granted, of course, there will be those, you know, situations where there these experiences that continue to happen, but more than ever, I think we're really seeing um, people come together. Even locally, there was like a newspaper that ran a satirical article and it was, um, you know, making fun of the Asian community. And a lot of uh, people who were not Asian American came out and spoke. And so I feel for our community, the sense of, you know, strength and appreciation that others are being so vocal for us in this kind of really difficult time. I would say that the challenges are that when we were talking about the racist attacks in specifically, that we have a hard time getting our community to report though. You know, one is maybe distrust from the government and the other is because because they don't see what's what happens after you report. So, like, what is the point of reporting? Or they feel like the issue is is not large enough. Like, you know, if if it wasn't a violent attack, that um, if it was just a verbal attack, that they don't know how to report. And so that that's kind of something we're trying to work on in our community of education around why it's still important to to report so that the government, uh, you know, the police departments are aware that these incidents are happening because what um, it's occurring now is that it's hard to really gauge the kind of the issues going on in community if like our own community aren't willing to report. Um, the other thing in regards to just the economic relationship with the government is that I do think it is a challenge for um, people in our community to access some of the resources that the government's able to provide and largely because of language barriers. So oftentimes we, because we are so diverse, there's certain ethnic groups that get overlooked. So even if we are translating documents or translating information and doing work in the community, oftentimes that's in you know the top maybe three to four Asian languages. And so there's still a lot of disparities in the way that the work is being done and the way kind of these resources are trickling down. Um, I will say though that the you know, local government, a lot of these programs and services, they've really done a lot to reach out to the Asian community. Um, I think we talked about how funding has looked differently and our communities come together to really work together. So coming out of all of this, like we have started an Asian American Pacific Islander um, 
coalition as well to really partner and see how we can apply for funding together and, and um, similar to what Thomas is saying, but use our resources um, more strategically to support each other. And a lot of it is how can we be more uh, visible when it comes to like working with the government or even the school systems to say like, hey, we're here too. You know, I think what we've really seen is a part of why there's this kind of fear or misunderstanding of our community is because our community is so small. And a lot of times people have had no experience or exposure with an Asian person. So they have a lot of assumptions and biases about like who we are. And so our community in Colorado, we only make up 4% of the state. So, you know, oftentimes I'm saying, I say, you know, that's, that's in a room of a hundred people. People. There are only like three other people that might look like me, you know, and so of course, a lot of times people don't know like anything about our community. So we're really trying to do a lot more kind of education and and, and pushing our own community to go sit on boards to get involved in the, their you know neighborhood association or to just be more civically engaged to show people like, hey, we're here and we are making contributions to the society and we are a part of like the fabric of the community. Thank you. I would like to encourage uh, folks who have questions to please submit those through the Q&A channel and we will collect those and have an opportunity to pose your questions to our panelists here in just a moment. You know, COVID certainly both exposed and deepened a lot of the really um, significant inequities that exist in communities of color in particular. And I am, and it seems that there's been a growing conversation about the structural drivers of those inequities, the systemic racism that is that results in the inequities that we see in in health outcomes or economic outcomes, et cetera. I am curious if um, any of you are starting to hear conversations locally about addressing some of those systemic inequities. Are you part of those conversations or perhaps leading those conversations? Um, and if so, tell us about them and tell us kind of what your um, prediction is in terms of what changes might actually come of some of those conversations. And Thomas, we're going to start with you this time. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, you know, um, inequities, um, there's a lot, you know, uh, just, you know, history of Native Americans, you know, being taught in school, you know, the correct history or their full history. Um, that's, you know, one of the things, you know, we think about, about, you know, dissemination of, of information, because sometimes people don't know the history of, you know, uh, the relationship of the U.S. government uh, towards Native Americans. Um, that's, you know, one thing that, you know, we think about. Also, you know, um, the personification of us in being, uh, you know, a mascot, um, you know, we were very um, crucial and uh, offered a lot of input into, you know, the mascot bill that uh, Governor um, Polis, you know, signed um, into um, into law, um, you know, uh, being on the commission, we were offered, you know, our input and how we felt about it. And um, a lot of different organizations offered that, you know, saying, you know, how they felt, uh, wh what they thought, you know, offered uh, testimony, um, you know, at that level saying, you know, this is how it impacts, this is how it makes me feel. When I grew up, this is, um, you know, how I thought about it, um, you know, and, um, you know, those are powerful viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And those are, you know, some of the things that, um, you know, that we think about um, with this inequity, you know, and at the Indian Center, we try to be there for the community in so many ways, you know, that was just one of the things that we thought about, um, you know, and then, you know, COVID impact in our community. Um, again, you know, we uh, collaborated and came together because um, we didn't know if some of that money was going to trickle down eventually to us and how long that money would it take to get to to us, you know, in the city because we are not tribally funded. We um, are far away from tribal lands. So that kind of capital is not there. So we have to, you know, rely on city and county and federal kind of um, sources of revenue. So we said, you know, we're doing okay now. Um, but down the line, we don't know um, how those funding structures are going to look. So, you know, uh, you know, that goes back to the inequities and how how, um, you know, Native Americans have that relationship with the government. Um, we're at the city level. Um, we also thought about people on tribal governments and some of that funding that was going to go there. Even now, uh, we're helping people do some of the paperwork for that, uh, you know, being a hub for them since some of the tribal lands that uh, people reside in Denver are far, you know, as uh, far as, you know, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, um, Alaska, even, you know, Arizona. So we're trying to be that hub of, uh, of our Native people to help them in this time of COVID. 
Ricardo, you described some of the uh, opportunities and maybe challenges of being in a uh, rural conservative part of the state. I'd love to hear you talk about what what conversations you're a part of about how to get at the root cause, some of the, the drivers of the inequities, the structural issues that cause the inequities, including things like systemic racism? Yes. Um, um, the Hispanic Affairs Project was born in 2005 in Western Colorado by leaders um, of the immigrant community. Um, in the very beginning, our goal was um, working for social justice, immigrants' rights. So we had this experience from the very beginning about uh, working uh, in with our community, but also working with others, the receiving community, local government, nonprofit sector, governmental entities, churches, to create a safe space for everyone where every person, no matter where we are coming from, we are welcome and we are feeling safe. So the, the, uh, this concept about equity is, is in, in our soul, is in the core of our work we are doing every day. This explains why the Hispanic Affairs Project is working in advocacy from the day one, in the very beginning. Actually, the Hispanic Affairs Project was born uh, during the McCain-Kennedy proposal of immigration reform in 2005. So we were organizing our communities across to the state, um, trying to respond to this critical situation. So what's happened now with COVID was the possibility to advance in this conversation about equity, because we demonstrate again and again that how our society could be better how our communities have the capacity to work together to create an environment with social and economic um, disparity can be overcome. Uh, the, the COVID gave us the chance to have a very direct conversation with new people as leaders in the community to say, look at this, this is not fair. How this happened that one family working full time, losing the job, uh, um, both the, the father, the mother working together, and, and just they are losing one job or two jobs, and the next month they are facing a very critical financial situation. Mm. Was, was, it's, not, it's not acceptable for in the families working full time. And I would like to tell you something. In this hard time, we also, I, uh, again, the, uh, find how our immigrant community, our base, is so resilient. Because at the same time, we were facing many people suffering for the inequality. We also find many people to say, um, Ricardo, um, I have savings, so I, I have savings. I don't need help right now, but I know in my neighborhood other people who are in need. So we were trying to, through our inside in our community, we were trying to coordinate to support those people in need. I would like to tell you something happening in the very, very beginning. Um, uh, uh, in the very beginning of the pandemic, in March, pretty much, uh, we found some uh, churches or nonprofit organizations. Uh, for example, uh, we know very good planning about the or using the resources like providing food. Um, and we we found uh, and very and very good people also mm -hmm. because uh, in the nonprofit uh, um, here in the Western Slope is very focused in charity, in 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 direct services. Uh, we will uh, we think that we can be. Do, we can do better with advocacy and promoting policies, policies, practices to overcome the inequality. But the example um, I would like to share with you is that the situation that in the very beginning we found uh, some organizations providing food, uh, basket bags with food. 
Um, um, I remember to be there when they, they were trying to distribute food, but no one was taking the food because it was not the big problem in the community. And I was scratching my head. Where is this idea coming from that right now people are dying with uh, because the lack of food? So I say we need to be very strategic and to say uh, our few resources because the heat is coming not right now mm -hmm. in March, is coming in, in later, in few months. Mm -hmm. So we were preparing, um, and thanks to many uh, several foundations who very uh, who were supporting us uh, to create the Western Colorado Immigrants Relief Fund uh, mm -hmm. for to providing cash assistance for families impacted by COVID, and also for our uh, immigrant uh, our receiving community, non-immigrants, who in the very beginning they were giving us uh, to the organization checks coming from the federal cash uh, mm -hmm. uh, relief assistance to say, I, I, I would like to donate this, uh, this uh, check for, uh, for the work you are doing, uh, HAP is doing in the community, and please be sure that this is going to families in need. So it was a very amazing, beautiful coordination, but also it's a call for us as a nonprofit how we can use our resources in a very intelligent manner and how could, could be very strategic in the way we are supporting our community, not creating dependency, not creating assistance, this sense of uh, the, um, just to put the hand, like we say, putting the hand and to receive something. No, uh, we recognize that our immigrant community here, low-income families are very resilient. Yeah. And we, and, and the nonprofit sector, the Hispanic Affairs Project, we are playing a very important role to support, together, advocate for policies to overcome inequality. Yeah. Thank you, Ricardo. Annie, have you been a part of any conversations or seen some movement on addressing um, systemic drivers of inequities, including structural racism? Sure. So similar to what Thomas had shared in our community is that when we were really thinking about, I know I keep talking about the racial injustices that we're experiencing, but I think that is just unique to our community. Like we're in it right now, right? It's, it continues to happen. Like these attacks are continuing to happen and vandalism of Asian businesses are still happening. So, um, so I know that's kind of what I'm focusing on, but we'll try to talk a little bit about the economic and health disparities as well. But um, what Thomas was sharing around education, it, it really came to that for us. Like what, why do the, people have these perceptions about our community and who we are. And a lot of it is just this complete lack of education. And going back to the statistic of, oh, there's only 4% Asian. So if you don't know an Asian person, <laughs> if you're not taught Asian American history in school, then, then what do you know about Asian people, right? And so the kind of lack of being included in American history, there's been a lot of effort and work around that. Um, some starting with the Asian American educators in our community, so teachers at all levels of education have been coming together, and then also through the parents. The parents um, have started task force groups in, in the different school districts. And we've been meeting with school district, um, going and attending at their meetings and giving you know public comment around the importance of this. And, and I will say it's really interesting. I, I do remember initially we thought like, oh, this makes sense, like teaching about different cultures. Um, you know, this is a win-win for all students. And it actually has been met with backlash and, you know, organizations or um, individuals of other groups attending those too and explaining why that shouldn't happen and that we don't want to, you know, teach history because it's divisive and it will make young people at a young age start thinking about racism and making them kind of have this like animosity towards each other. And so we've really trying to actually have to combat like that narrative to, to explain like why this is important. And part of it, I will say too, is even educating our own community and our own youth, because we don't even know our own history. And so telling our own community, like you need to learn about who you are, like your family's history here, you know, um, to be able to educate other people. And so much of it is because of this kind of systemic problem that we are just ingrained to to believe like this is what education is we are not going to challenge it you know and we're just taught what we're taught and that's what we're supposed to learn and so there's been a lot of work around that um 
I, I'm hoping some movement can happen soon. But basically right now, the state does have um, legislation that says multicultural education, around multicultural education. But I guess the loophole in it is that the school and the school districts can determine what that looks like. So it could be you offer one or two classes for one cultural group and then you say, okay, we offered multicultural education. And so a lot of communities are still being left behind. And so I think that's one area that is really important when we really try to look upstream as to where some of these problems start is, is with the education that young people are receiving. Um, the other is some that came to mind was just um, pushing for more culturally and linguistically appropriate care is that a lot of times, again, because of the language barriers, our community just can't access the same kinds of services. So even though it's great that like, you know, government funders are providing services, um, they're not for us. They're not, they didn't consider what it looks like for our community. And so what has come out of the pandemic is, a lot of um, more strength actually within ourselves. And so I do think that there is power in that, that we're not just depending on government or other resources, is that sometimes, you know, the answer is in our own community. And so through that, a lot of organizations have actually been founded during the last two years. So new organizations that are coming up, we have, um, you know, consulting groups that's starting to do racial equity training, like um, run by Asian American women. We have an organization that is helping Asian American uh, middle school girls. And so through that, through all of this, I think our community is actually feeling more driven than before because suddenly this need that has always been there, but has really been um, more exposed. We're, we're understanding like we need to come forward and, you know, get involved. Mm -hmm. And so some of the other things, like I was saying around civic engagement and um, the advocacy piece too, is trying to get more Asian Americans to even run for office. <laughs> so originally my notes I wrote get them elected in office, but no, it's actually to even get people in our own community to feel comfortable enough to go out there and, um, you know, like try to make a difference in that political space. And a lot of times Asians are very apathetic. And part of it is because we don't really understand what is going on. You know, like we don't know really even how the government works. And so trying to do a lot of education in our community, this is how it works. This is the importance of getting involved. And then eventually like getting people um, represented in those spaces. And a lot does go to representation in general in different spaces because we are not seen in a lot of these, I guess, decision-making or power-influencing roles. And so one thing that comes to mind that we're working on now, too, is, is just having more voice in the redistricting process. And so as we're looking at Colorado's maps, we're really trying to educate our community, say, yes, our community is still small, but we can still have some political or, like, power in some areas to make a difference um, and to just start with those areas, to start with just educating people, like, what does redistricting districting mean and how does that affect our communities? Because there are, are, are pockets where there are larger Asian American communities. And so trying to say like, look, let's just see like kind of what can we do with this community? Could we elect someone from our community um, into to local office in, in those spaces? Um, and again, just with a lot of the trainings, we have been, there's been a lot of outreach to our community to provide trainings and you know, to participate in panels like this. And I think that's what's exciting is that that the discussions, the conversations are happening uh, more and more visibly and faster than before. So people are wanting to hear what's happening in your community and, and you know, what can we do? Yeah. So um, there's been a lot of outreach to us uh, from different organizations, like companies who are looking at their policies and their processes mm -hmm. about how can they look at how they're hiring mm -hmm. or how they are, um, you know, retaining people of color. And so I feel like sometimes change is hard to see while it's, you know, in well, work in progress, but I can feel yeah. that there's movement. Yeah. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thomas, I saw you nodding a lot while Annie was speaking. I didn't know if you wanted to add on to anything she was saying. I know in particular on the education system and some of yes. those things. Yes, um, 
Um, yes, again, the uh, Denver Indian Center um, also, you know, was thinking about housing. Uh, we started Native American mm -hmm. Housing Circle mm -hmm. to address specific needs. Um, our um, unhoused relatives on the street, um, I myself sit on, you know, a task force trying to address some of the inequities in policing and uh, trying to come to solutions, you know, around, you know, that whole issue around policing. So, again, the Denver Indian Center is thinking outside the box, right. new perspectives, just seeing, you know, how we can collaborate and how we can represent in our uh, respective communities. Yeah. I'm going to ask one more question and then turn to some audience questions. There is still opportunity to submit questions through the Q&A channel, so please continue to do that. I want to pick up on a theme all of you have spoken about, which is collaboration. Um, Ricardo, you spoke specifically, specifically about collaboration with government in your, um, uh, some of your earlier comments. Um, Thomas and Annie, you spoke about coalitions and collaborations with nonprofits and other community organizations. I'd love to hear from each of you what you have learned about what makes effective collaborations. And Ricardo, we'll start with you on that one. Um, the, my first comment about that is uh, no duplicate services. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am working in small communities uh, in the western Colorado. Um, sometimes when a non another nonprofit is trying to do the same job, another nonprofit is doing this create a very uh, stressful time. So I think uh, every nonprofit, uh, just to give you one example, I am living in Montrose. And in Montrose, there are more than 300 nonprofits, maybe more. So everyone can create a nonprofit here, and this is great. But uh, we, not, we, need, we need to be clear with our mission, the way that we are not duplicating efforts. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in the community I am living, there is a process right now where uh, we are trying to clarify the role every nonprofit is providing to the community to be sure that we are serving very well and we are not services. Mm -hmm. The other operation is about to be, um, I would like to use the word, to be very picky. Uh, sometimes it's beautiful to have collaboration with uh, 25 organizations and talking about equity. But sometimes uh, we can spend years, years and years talking about equity and what we can do together, but nothing happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be very realistic. I remember my father when say when uh, say hey you need to be careful with your friends you need to you need to select your friends you need to be uh, who, is a, who is a good friend for you so you can learn from them and um, be, and do something better so it's the same for the nonprofit now is to say hey we need to be, to 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 be sure uh, we, who is in line with our mission with our goals in working and doing something for our community. And another, another comment, um, it's about that uh, I mentioned before in the Western Slope, I would like, uh, I don't want to say something for this whole state, but in my experience in the Western Slope, um, the nonprofit who has a very long tradition here and doing many beautiful things for the community, but is very focused in charity, direct services. Mm -hmm. And I think the nonprofit, we can do more, more in advocacy. I hear Carlos Martinez before this afternoon talking about advocacy, advocacy, and advo advocacy. And I think we are missing a very important role and responsibility uh, as a nonprofit to use our capacity. And this is not necessary to be involved in politics directly, like a, as a, a political parties. Uh, nonprofits, we can do a lot in advocacy in the way that our members, we provide leadership capacity, civic engagement, so our members are active participating and voicing what they want. Mm. Uh, also, like uh, mentioned my uh, colleague here, it's about also how to participate in office. So we, we have a lot capacity to do more with our communities and also in collaboration with other nonprofits in the way that we really uh, work in advocacy. And no, and I would like to, to say this one. Uh, I, sometimes I am feeling like uh, the 
social justice or equity is the new work for a nonprofit uh, to make a more attractive grant proposal. Mm. Um, I believe we need to review our internal work practices and policies if we are talking about equity and inequality and we want to work in this to overcome inequality, we need to change. And this needs to start with us internally. Yeah. So I am inviting my colleagues in the, in the nonprofit industry uh, just to evaluate how we are balancing direct services, charity, and advocacy. Mm. And let's work together. This is the place we can collaborate and to make a change. Thank you, Ricardo. Mm. Some great points there. Thomas, you spoke about a number of collaborations that you've had um, specifically during the pandemic to address the needs of your community. What, may, what has made those effective and successful from your perspective? Um, well, uh, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, um, great care must be taken when new allegiance are made, um, you know, and uh, having that flexibility. Uh, thinking outside the box, um, it was hard for us even with similar organizations um, is just finding, um, you know, that intersection of the workflow of the resources and how best to be efficient, you know, when working with a similar organization um, because every organization is unique and uh, they do things differently than other organizations and maybe that's what makes them, you know, stand out uh, among the others. So, you know, thinking about, um, that flexibility, that openness, you know, saying, hey, we may not do this this way, but they do it this way. And there may be some value in that. And there may be, you know, um, something we can apply towards our organization. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, um, having that, um, that mindset and just also, you know, um, being very, very um, cognizant and aware of the stress of all of this. Um, all of this may be new for some organizations, uh, being, you know, virtual or, you know, not in person and, you know, not having that direct service, uh, making that, um, you know, um, jump ahead to be innovative. And, you know, um, we all uh, didn't know kind of what to do, but, you know, having somebody else there that, uh, you know, is in the same situation, you know, is reassuring, but also, you know, uh, helps you um, think, hey, you know, we can innovate, we can get out of this, we can, you know, put our heads together and, you know, be human. Yeah. Thank you. Annie, you spoke specifically about coalitions and some work that you're doing in coalitions. I'm wondering if you can speak about coalition work specifically in terms of what makes effective coalitions. Yes, so in our community, a, a coalition has formed. <laughs> there was a lot of different work already going on, and I do think it, it did feel very siloed. And in the past, there was an organization called the Asian Roundtable of Colorado, and um, they would come together, had different member organizations. It was like the umbrella group for the Asian community, and it was started such a long time ago with, I would say, just like an older generation. And so the topic, um, as Ricardo mentioned, of social justice, racial justice, you know, that just wasn't on the, the forefront back then. You know, and I'll say even with Asian Avenue Magazine, my mom and I started the magazine in 2006, and initially it was about culture and food and travel and, you know, very approachable topics, right? And there's been this huge shift to say, like, you know, you have these platforms now, and it's important for you to speak up about what's happening and, and really be a voice for some people in your community too who often you know aren't seen at all and so for us um this coalition is a new one that formed and it's really around addressing these um inequities that exist in the community and so really thinking about yes we all have um you know different uh, interests, <laughs> right? Like we have this Asian Realtors Association, the Asian Bar Association, which is made up of the lawyers and um, then, of course, a lot of the nonprofit groups that are providing services to the community. So it's like, what what do we all have in common, you know, other than just being Asian, right? And so really understanding like our shared vision of what we're trying to do for the community together. And so um, I think that there's so much value and um, skills that 
individuals and organizations can bring. And so to really be able to understand that, and we talked a lot about being more strategic, because I think in the past we are just kind of all running around doing different things or like an issue comes up and someone just starts working on it. And so um, how can we really um, leverage all of the knowledge and, you know, strengths in our own community? And so I will say it goes back to trust, right? And so we talked a lot about relationship building. And so for, for our coalition, a lot of the relationships already existed in community so that when there was an issue, you could move quickly, you know, and I do think that's important is like whether it's a formalized coalition or not in every community or, you know, groups of interest, um, to have those relationships really already in place, it is important. And and I know it is challenging because I think in the past, um, what Ricardo was saying around sometimes nonprofits like competing against each other for the same funding. And so really having a new outlook on that is like, you're not competitors, right? Like you, sure, maybe it's the same funding, but how can we be more strategic around you do this part of this work, you do this part of the work, you know, like I'll write you into the grant as a partner, maybe you apply for this one. And so really trying to be more collaborative because when you you look at others in your own community as, you know, rivals, you're hurting your own community. You're really going against the whole mission of both your organizations, right? And so to me, the relationships do have to go beyond just like meetings, right? It, it really is that informal, like, can I just text you? And I saw an article and I just want to share it with you, or let's laugh about this thing, right? And um, talking about things that are unrelated to work, you know, now I know with COVID, we're not really meeting, but it is like the staying after the meetings or, you know, like staying on a little longer, I guess, after a Zoom to, to talk about other things. And and so to me, too, like going into these spaces with empathy and really listening to understand. And the example I think of right now is really vaccines. Um talking about vaccine confidence and hesitancy, but really listening with more empathy and um, trying to understand why, for example, some people are not getting vaccinated. And so, you know, for me, I know there's a lot of frustration in, in communities around like, oh, we have like a viable solution to control the pandemic. And so what's the issue? Like, how do we convince people or how do we just get them to do it? And it's actually having to kind of take a step back to be like, okay, I'm actually really willing to listen to you mm -hmm. to understand like what your challenge is with it or your, your uh, fears around that. And so um, I'm not just going into every conversation with an intent to persuade somebody to do something that I want, you know? And so I really think about that when we're talking about collaboration and coalition building is that you're trying to kind of understand what the other person um, is coming in with instead of always having your hat on of like, okay, this is what I want to happen from this conversation. And, and the last thing I'll just say is that I don't think sometimes people are, are ready for some of these equity and justice um, conversations or, or to even do anything. And so trying to understand that too, of like, okay, well, what can someone start with based on where they're at? So whether that's in their workplace or a community person, because, you know, there's community leaders even in the Asian community who don't, I think, really understand equity. <laughs> like there is someone recently that actually came out and said racism doesn't exist and that people who think it does is because you choose to see racism. And so, you know, like I choose to not look at the world in that way and I choose not to overthink all those things. And so, um, you know, this is a person that's like wanting to lead in the community. And so I think just trying to really understand like, oh, well, we're, what experiences have you had or, you know, what um, you know privileges have you had that allow you to think that way and that you still need to have more conversations with other people, right? And so just trying to understand that because I do think it's really easy to get burnt out, you know, because you're constantly out there talking about these things and wanting people to get involved and like pushing and challenging and ultimately like you're just tired, you know? And I think a lot of times why work and movement does not happen is because the people who are so like enthusiastic about doing this, they get burnt out, you know? And so I think it is important to sometimes be like, okay, this person isn't quite ready. You know, like we're, we'll have this conversation maybe another day or, you know, they, they maybe need to have some other, you know, experiences and do a little bit more, you know, reading on their own. And it's not up to me to get everybody kind of right. involved and engaged right. in this work. Annie, thanks. You've actually um, beautifully set up a couple of audience questions. So we're going to segue into some questions from our audience for our panelists. And the first one is about vaccines and vaccine equity, vaccine acceptance in your communities. And Thomas, I know you've, Denver Indian Center has done quite a bit of work with vaccines 
talk about those issues of um, acceptance and trust and how those interplay with your work to um, ensure vaccine uptake in the, the uh, community that you serve? Yes, that's um, a very, very great question. Um, First off, we were able to get the vaccine uh, through the federal government. Um, uh, one of the organizations, uh, you know, did the paperwork to do it. The only caveat was they had to drive all the way to Albuquerque to get it. Okay. So they, uh, you know, were able to get a vehicle and get uh, the vaccine the night before, bring it up uh, and have it ready for our community. So again, you know, um, we knew the, the importance of having the vaccine and offering it to the community. So we collaborated uh, with the organization and offered, you know, the vaccine at the Denver Indian Center, um, but made sure, you know, that uh, everybody in our community was aware um, of, you know, um, everything around the vaccine and uh, ensured, you know, uh, again, that trust that, you know, we were behind it. And since we were facilitating and offering, you know, the place to have the vaccine, um, that trust went a long way. Uh, that helped our programs also continue on, uh, you know, getting participants or even, you know, uh, resources out to the community. Um, we uh, con are continuing doing that, you know, with our youth vaccination clinics. Uh, we're, we have the Pfizer vaccine and we're making sure that, you know, everybody is aware, you know, of the vaccine that we have and that, you know, we are behind the vaccines and we are behind wearing masks, you know, whatever, you know, people's, um, you know, stance is on that. You know, the most of the uh, Native organizations in Colorado are, you know, behind what, um, you know, uh, everybody's doing. Ricardo, any vaccine work that you want to just comment on on the Western Slope in terms of vaccine equity and vaccine hesitancy within the community that you work with? I think this is, um, we are ad advancing in education with the community little by little. There are many, like, um, Annie Tom, Thomas uh, explained that there are many challenges in the community, uh, a lot of misinformation. In the very beginning, when we were trying to organize some vaccination clinics, uh, mobile clinics and those stuff in our communities, in, the, in several communities in the Western Slope, uh, and was a very, in the beginning, uh, the, the health and human services clinic, hospital, they were very accessible, very friendly with the immigrant community, trying to be sure uh, immigrants, uh, Spanish-speaking people receive the assistance. We organize, uh, especially in Grand Junction, Montrose, Ganison, was amazing clinics just focused in the cultural uh, relevance, uh, competency. So immigrants, Spanish-speaking people uh, were more welcome to come. Was was a success, but uh, uh, in, was a success in organizing those activities. But uh, sadly, uh, we found those challenge with our community regarding with a lot of misinformation. So I think we have a long road uh, to educate ourselves and others about the importance to care and to create a better message mm. because uh, also uh, it's very important to, to um, uh, um, there, there are message, uh, social media message that is not the, the same, the, uh, means the same for everyone. It depends. Um, we have a very, um, uh, also in the Western Slope, we have a Kora indigenous community who has an, a different, different social media, different way to communicate and to share information. Uh, so uh, the, the, I, I think we, we are in the process still. Um, in this moment, also recently, we received the, the invitation to organize to other clinics or to provide uh, a space, but now that the hospital, human services, clean, local uh, community clinics, pharmacies, they are providing the vaccine. We are trying to be sure that the families, individuals receive the information mm -hmm. and they can go there. Uh, we are now uh, planning to do uh, mobile clinics because uh, I th we don't want to go in the assistential assistentialism directly. I think most of the families, they know where the pharmacy, clinic, hospitals, they are providing the vaccine. Uh, so we want to be sure the, fam the families are um, get this information and they are uh, uh, feeling um, comfortable, safe mm -hmm. to go for. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ricardo. 
So we have quite a few audience questions. In order to make our way through as many as possible, I'll just invite um, any of you who have something to share or something to offer in response to these questions to just pop in um, and, and uh, share any response or reactions to the questions. Um, the first one is interesting. Um, what, how do you work with small businesses when you think about community-driven solutions? Are any of you doing work with small businesses in your community that you would like to highlight for the audience? Um, I would just like to say uh, uh, during, um, you know, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we still had a food bank um, and we knew our community uh, may need that resource. So uh, we hired uh, somebody who was local, a uh, Native American who had, you know, um, the um, traffic, uh, what are those, the traffic signs? So we, we purchased one of those for a couple months and we used that just to let people know in the community that, hey, we have a food bank. These are the dates and the times that you can come. Uh, please wear a mask and be socially distanced because that was the only time that we were going to open the center uh, to be there for the community. Um, and even on that end, you know, uh, we had to advocate, you know, to get, you know, the delivery of food there because we were, you know, saying, hey, you guys are closed, but we are still open and mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. are a critical community. Um, and, you know, again, the collaboration there was uh, with the uh, American Indian Commission. Uh, uh, you know, there was a good uh, collaborative effort there to get, you know, food to the Indian Center so we could distribute it not only to our community but the whole Westwood community um, as a whole. Yeah, that's a great example. Annie or Ricardo, small business uh, partnerships? Um, I'll say that the Asian Chamber of Commerce is really active in our local community. And so they have you know, a membership where they do work with businesses. They provide all kinds of resources, um, support on how to access a lot of the relief funds. And they were really the ones to organize the relationships with some of the elected officials. So um, you know, Representative Crow, um, Senators uh, Bennett and Hickenlooper, they came out to the Asian community. So that was really nice. I mean, they, they went to visit the business areas. So the Far East Center, which is on Alameda and Federal, and then Sakura Square, which is like the Japanese area in downtown Denver. And so the chamber, I would say, is um, really active in supporting our businesses who really want to feel more support right now. One of the things we've been doing is building out a business directory. So this, there was just so much back and forth on this. So I'll just share a, you know, a challenge when you even seek to do something like this, but that the Asian community, similar to after George Floyd last year, was that we saw in black communities this kind of support wanting to support the business owners. And so we know that a lot of apps like you know Google and Yelp started identifying if it was a black owned business. And so um, we were thinking, oh, well, our community wants to do that. And a lot of people who were saying, oh, we want to support your community. What can we do? This is horrible, like all this Asian hate happening. And we just didn't have anything like in place. We started working on this business directory to say like, here, here's some businesses you could support. And then there was actually some pushback because people were like, well, I don't want to be on this list. Like, like, essentially, you're putting me on this list so people know that I'm Asian-owned, and then they're going to come and, like, harass me because there was vandalism going on. And I think that's what some of the challenges, too, with some of kind of these racist acts is that it's hard to say if it's, it's um, you know, bias-motivated, if it's a hate crime, because sometimes it would just be a rock is getting thrown into this Asian-owned business over and over again, you know, four times, but none of the businesses around it, right? And then we can't say what exactly is happening. And so it's tough because, um, you know, when you think about what resources do you provide, is it more preventative and like around try to avoid that things happening? Or is it more around how can we support you after something has happened to your business, you know? And so, so right now we are trying to just have funds available for organizations and businesses that have experienced some, um, they, they kind of need some kind of victim assistance or business assistance. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing, I did want to just say a little bit about the vaccine equity part. Sorry, I just was taking a little bit of notes, is that um, we did do a lot of equity clinics, is how they were called in our community as well. Um, mobile clinics, you know, the, the bus going into these areas I was talking about. And I will mention on Havana Street, um, had quite a few as well in Aurora and worked with a refugee clinic called KHEP. And what made them different is that we were able to get um, volunteers from the community. Right? So there was Asian um, 
volunteers and languages that were spoken. And so that's what made it a little bit more accessible to our community. But I think the challenge is that I do remember back then, I feel like there's been so many phases of this vaccine rollout. So back then it was um, asking community organizations to host these clinics. And part of it was that you would get 200 vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we were hearing from the community was like, I cannot commit to 200. And I feel like all this pressure, like what if I can't get people in here? And, um, you know, like our community is already quite small than to try to have to commit to 200. It was really hard. So there's just some things I think sometimes like the intent is really good, mm -hmm. but it actually prevented a lot of community organizations from wanting to volunteer to do it because of that pressure of, I don't think I can, I can get that many people actually. So I think like, why, why can't I just get like 50 people or something? Right. You just give me 50, like give me what I think I can use. And so, mm -hmm. um, right now the Colorado health foundation has been doing focus groups with the black African American communities and with the Latino Latinx communities. And so we've been trying to learn a lot from what we're hearing from these communities, but there hasn't really been that much data um, for the Asian community. And again, because the, the numbers are so small, you know, because even some of the studies have been like, well, then there were some Asians that were in the survey, but it's really just not enough of a sample. So, so in our own community, we are working with a student at the Colorado, Colorado Public School, um, School of Public Health, and she's doing focus groups specifically for um, Asians. And we're really looking at those that are more underrepresented. So the Nepali, Burmese, and Thai communities. And I will say, in the beginning, there was a lot of physical and logistical barriers is what we were hearing. Like they didn't know how to set up an appointment. They didn't have a ride. Uh, but now it's really the beliefs, right? And the, the, those kind of other issues. And so for our community, it's a lot of them getting news from their home country. And so depending on how, you know, the, the news is being shared, you know, they're, they're listening to news that's not necessarily from the States. They are also business owners who just cannot get s sick, you know? So one was like, they can't go. And then when we started saying, well, look, there's this mobile clinic that can just come to you, it was also like, oh, I can't be sick for two days because I work seven days a week right. at my shop, you know? And so, um, again, I think going back to what I said earlier about not being so quick to judge, because I'm also feeling like this new phase we're in is that people don't want you to know if they are vaccinated or not, right? Because they're afraid of being judged now. And so that's really, I think, counterproductive to what we're trying to do when we're trying to encourage our community to get it with um, without shaming them, you know? So yeah. um, that's just what I wanted to yeah. say. No, thank you. Thank you for adding that. Ricardo, I'd like to pose this next question um, to you and then invite Annie and Thomas to add if, if they have additional thoughts. But um, the question is, what would you say to nonprofits afraid or unsure if they can or should do advocacy or systems change work? Could you please to repeat the question? Yeah. The, the question is, what would you say to nonprofits who are hesitant to engage in systems change or advocacy work? How would you um, try to, to uh, address their concerns about engaging in things that are beyond direct services and really more upstream in the advocacy space? I think, I think the Nonprofit in general in Western Slope, where is my experience, uh, are more in line with the dominant culture, very white uh, community, uh, very conservative, uh, where everyone, uh, uh, where nonprofits are more comfortable uh, to provide direct assistance and working in the charity. I believe this is the easy way to support the community. There is another more challenging way, but the right thing to do is in terms of systemic change, advocacy, policy change. And I believe, as I mentioned before, we are getting very short. And we, as a nonprofit, we have a, a lot to do in order to ensure that we are playing our role in our communities. Um, I mentioned in the beginning as well the how uh, now, especially during the pandemic, during the COVID, understanding how the roles are between the uh, local government, state government, and also the nonprofit. We can do together more and we can ensure that we are putting in uh, our resources locally in order to provide more capacity to our communities. Um, 
I believe in the, I participate in the immigrant movement in from the very beginning when I came to United States in 2003. I was uh, pretty much organizing in 2004 with our immigrant community in the Western Slope. And I would like to, to go back to share this experience. The immigrant community has a lot, is, is, is right now, is a big movement in Colorado, very well organized, and we are achieving a very important goals, uh, policies in the state level. Just recently, in the last legislative session, we had amazing, positive, protecting families, protecting dignity of the immigrant community in Colorado. And we did it, but this was not easy. It was a very long work. I remember in 2006, a group of leaders of uh, representing the immigrant community before the uh, legislators in Colorado and how they were attacked. This happened in 2006. Uh, 2021, even in the middle of the, pan the, the COVID crisis, but we have the capacity to advance in a very important policies to make a real systemic change, overcome racism, mm -hmm. overcome inequality. We had a lot to do still, but we need as a nonprofit um, industry to evaluate how we are incorporating advocacy and how we are promoting, and this is very important, civic engagement. Nonprofits um, has the opportunity to provide leadership development, capacity to our communities. We can do a lot, we can do more, if we are not doing something for the community, we will do more if we are doing with, with the community. Mm. And I remember somebody say, um, a, a, a immigrant friend say, I am no a leader in the immigrant community because I, or when I am speaking, I am not representing the immigrant community because my role as a leader is to provide the voice to the people. Uh, every individual in our community has the capacity to participate, to cultivate the civic engagement, and to make a change. And I can, uh, I, I, I testify that we are seeing this experience in the Western Slope in our community, uh, having members, uh, including and document members in our community, women who maybe never went to the school in Mexico, and now they are testifying, and they are participating uh, with the power, the voice coming from the personal experience and personal uh, um, uh, represent, uh, uh, participating as community before our elected officials talking about what we need and, and um, uh, what are impacting our communities and how we can uh, make better our society and our local communities. Thank you. Oh, I would just like to add, you know, um, resourcefulness, innovation, and uh, resiliency, you know. Um, I don't think us as Native people have ever stopped, you know, fighting towards uh, the many things that, you know, uh, plight our communities. Um, so again, you know, uh, just, uh, Thinking about you know being resilient and uh, thinking outside the box. Um, that's how you know we uh, will get ahead and you know try to um, get these uh, inequities um, and just you know having that faith to continue on. Uh, we as Native peoples, this is not our first pandemic, so uh, I think back to our resiliency and how we are innovative um, to come out um, stronger than before. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. This next question is about whether you are a part of or know about um, conversations that are happening to bridge across different racial and ethnic groups to address systemic racism. So I'm um, curious about that, if you're part of any coalitions um, doing that kind of cross-culture, cross-race, cross-ethnicity work. Um, I, I actually, you know, um, sit on a task force with, uh, I think it's about 80 organizations across Denver, um, many different multicultural um, organizations. So again, you know, it's having that uh, open mind um, and, you know, uh, being aware that, you know, 
uh, there's a common goal, you know, and it's, uh, you know, that inequity. And, you know, if we work towards solutions towards that, uh, not necessarily uh, with our perspective or our filter, you know, um, all those filters together, you know, I think would be a, a good solution towards these, you know, inequities that, uh, that we face. Um, but also seeing, you know, um, similarities, you know, uh, in other people, you know, um, and I, I'm real, you know, um, positive and, you know, hopeful for the future for all of us, you know, and finding solutions and, you know, working together and, um, you know, having that uh, innovative thought. Annie or Ricardo, any response to that question? Um, I have a few that come to mind. Is, is So one, on a national scale, there's been a lot of work around Asian and black solidarity. And a lot of that is because there's a lot of kind of mistrust and misunderstanding within our two communities. It's like a lot of um, the black African-American community has perceptions that the Asian community is just you know, again, like doesn't care about what's going on and apathetic, you know, their exposure to Asians is so limited that, um, you know, a lot of times they, um, the, the two communities get pitted against each other. And there's been a lot of conversations around model minority myth and what that means and how it's basically put our two communities kind of at the opposite ends of the spectrum, where then we're like fighting against each other. And so on a national scale, I'm a part of a few different groups around just trying to build, bridge that that gap within our two communities. And then locally, there's been some work around, um, I, I'm just thinking about the media because I'm with um, Asian Avenue Magazine, but the Rose Community Foundation and the Colorado Health Foundation have come together to start this Colorado Media Project. And so through that, it's all media organizations working with racially and ethnically diverse populations and, and really thinking about like the content and how to message things like COVID vaccine specifically to our communities. And so there is been a lot of collaboration, I'd say, around our, our various groups. We're all serving the different um, racial groups in Colorado, um, specifically in a, in, in a sector together. Okay, we are getting close to the end of our time. I have a couple more questions to pose. The, the first I'll pose, I would just invite any of you who have an answer or response to this question to jump in. The last question I will pose to each one of you. Um, so I will start with this one. Um, often truly working collectively in communities takes a long time, but funders have a short timeline. How do you all navigate that tension? Maybe uh, just, you know, uh, being aware of, you know, um, the timelines that, that we have and that we work within, um, you know, and explaining, you know, possibly, you know, some of the barriers and how some of these things will take time because of, you know, many things, you know, the trust, um, you know, and getting, you know, um, again, enough of the community involved. And then also, you know, being Native American, our community is so small, you know, fragment of a 1%, you know, so, you know, uh, getting that good data and getting, you know, um, all these things together, you know, that takes time, but just, uh, you know, reiterating to the funders that, you know, hey, our communities are critical, but they are, you know, also um, traumatized. So, you know, um, just uh, disseminating that information that, you know, it, it, change happens, but it takes time. Yeah, thank you. I'll just share that if the question is about how funders would like you to use the funding quickly for like a specific issue, um, that uh, the, the landscape, I'd say, between the funder and community relationship has really changed in the last two years. And so if we're going to say some good has come out of the pandemic and the racial um, you know, context that we're in is that funders are being more open to empowering or, you know, going to community to make those decisions now in a way that it was much more restrictive before. So uh, just what I've seen in the last two years, there's just so much more, um, I guess, trust in the community to, to lead where the funding is going. And so for me too, I would say I'm still kind of new to nonprofit. I started my organization in 2009 and have kind of had different experiences 
is with with grant writing and funding and a lot of our a lot of what we were always doing was just like our own services and um, you know charging money for events basically and so it's really shifted now where I'm like oh there's actually access to a lot more grants than I realized before. And, and the question earlier about like, why should a nonprofit start to, um, I would say like there's resources to work on this in a way that I think we've never seen before. And the, um, flexibility of funding has changed. And to me, sometimes too, let's say your grant period is two years. I think it's also um, kind of like not the end all be all. I think a lot of times people will feel like, well, that's not enough time to for us to really do anything, or I can't really hire anyone because it's a term limited job and all those things. But you know, you really can make a difference in, in that time. And then you like pivot or you readjust as needed. And so I think at the end of like a grant term, um, it is it is good to reevaluate and see like, well, what do we need now? Because in some of my other work in, in the local community, like we've been hearing like, well, um, like I, I work in with, with food insecurity for children and we've been hearing like, okay, yeah, it, it's shifting, you know, like what we needed when COVID first started and emergency support, it doesn't look the same now. And so I think sometimes, um, you know, it might feel like prohibitive or like, oh my gosh, we only have like a short amount of time, but, but it actually does allow you to rethink and then kind um, kind of readjust the, the strategies you're working on and and really um, assess the current need. And I will say that the pandemic has made that need feel like it's constantly changing. Like, okay, right now, this is really where we need the most support or our community, like this specific community is, is where we really need to help right now. And so um, I think there's been a little bit more flexibility actually with funding than in the past. Thanks, Annie. Ricardo, I saw you maybe had something to add on this question as well. Yes, I remember uh, after almost 15 years working close with uh, many foundations, I am, I am seeing some differences. In the very beginning, we were having more stress, uh, having a very big uh, grant proposals and very big reports that we need to do every six, uh, every year. I think the situation is changing a lot. And honestly, I am not feeling stressed with the, with the foundations uh, at this point. And we need to recognize that in Colorado, we have, we have the privilege to have a very good, amazing uh, foundations in the, in the state level, big foundations, but also in the community level. Actually, sometimes uh, in the Western Slope, uh, we are working with community foundations like they are another partners, mm. just very close, and also advocating for the same issues. Right now, we are with the, with some, in some community, we are planning to do something in regard, re, related with advocacy, uh, working the community foundation, the, the, the local government, and the Hispanic Affairs Project for immigrant integration. So are our friends. What is very important is also uh, regarding with the general operating grants. This is a good help because also in the very beginning with the pandemic, we, we had this flexibility mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, to, to use our resources, uh, financial resources, human resources to put in, in a new direction. What was a big surprise. My other comment is, um, I think the biggest stress as a nonprofit is not coming from foundations, it's coming more from the challenge we find every day in our daily work. Um, so, um, and this is, a, I think in Colorado, we are in a very good um, uh, position working together with amazing foundations and good, amazing nonprofits. All right, our last question. We are 17 months into the COVID pandemic. The future is murky at best, at least in terms of what the next months hold with regard to the trajectory of the pandemic. Um, a couple of you have mentioned in your comments in passing the issue of burnout. So we have a question from the audience about what advice you would give to your fellow nonprofit leaders about how you care for yourselves and how to um, avoid mitigate, limit this issue of burnout? That uh, self-care, you know, that's really, really uh, important, especially in, um, you know, um, when you're doing direct service and working with the community. Um, I found different forms of self-care, especially, you know, when you have to be inside, uh, finding new hobbies, finding new uh, things, new avenues about myself. 
So I thought that was really important. You know, the pandemic has changed so many things, including myself. So, um, you know, again, that self-care and finding new avenues to express and, uh, um, you know, have that self-care. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Do you want to share something? Sure. A quote that was shared with me with this work was that equity has to grow you, but not break you. And I think that's really stood with me. I just flipped that in my like notebook. But as that, what I was saying before too is that sometimes I think we're so passionate about it. You know, we're seeing the injustices. We're talking to people. We're hearing the stories, and we want to do something right away. You know, it, it's so unfair. It's heartbreaking. The community is in pain. You know, and so I think you feel this like weight to like do something, you know? And I think that's where a lot of the burnout starts happening because it's such, it's so much larger than you, right? It's really our community coming together. And I think we are in this post George Floyd era where conversations are happening about race in new places. So organizations and companies that are really looking at their policies and families and friends that are having really difficult conversations around this topic that wouldn't have or would have tried to avoid in the past. And even individuals that are really confronting their own biases and privileges. Um, and really, we're just kind of rethinking race and systems as we know it, right, as, as what we thought prior to kind of this time that we're in. And so um, I think there's a lot of opportunity now for, like, transformative change. Um, and so to keep that in mind is that change does take time. And so it's okay to, you know, turn things off or... Um, you know, disengage or know when to kind of walk away from a conversation that is really depleting you or, you know, when to stop scrolling and stop reading comments online. Um, but then, and, but then to, you know, come back to it at another time. And, um, I think that it's going to really take all of us, you know, and to know that you're not alone either. I think there's some kind of, you know, um, healing or, you know, faith <laughs> in that is that like, there's other good people out there that are trying to do the same thing that you are. Thank you, Annie. Ricardo, the last word on this question, what advice do you have for your fellow nonprofit leaders with regard to avoiding burnout? Uh, we care for each other in the, in the uh, glad in the Hispanic Affairs Project that our staff is very, and the board of directors is a very close team. So in the very beginning of the pandemic, we were trying to support each other. Was a different stress because uh, we as organization organizing and working in this field, ju just to, to, uh, to be in the nonprofit organizing is a stress, it's a stressful. Mm -hmm. And we spend weekends or evenings working and uh, organizing meetings, having with people different levels. Uh, this, this is a lot of stress. What we had during the COVID was a different stress but we, uh, we had this experience trying to care for each other internally, like we are trying to care for each other in the community. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I think the hardest part of doing this virtual event is that you don't get to hear what would be the thunderous applause of the audience um, at the conclusion of this panel. It's been tremendous, and we're grateful that you all spent uh, the afternoon with us. Thank you so much. All right, so, and our, our small audience here in Glendale is clapping furiously, so Ricardo and Annie, I hope you can see that, but if not, I wanted to share that. We are going to take a 60 second transition. Do not go away because you will want to be here for our final event, which is a fantastic performance from the synthesizers. Stay put, we're gonna reset the stage and we will be right back. We who believe in freedom believe will, not in rest. will not rest. Oh, we who believe in freedom will believe will not rest, rest until it comes. Oh, we who believe in we Freedom, we who believe we won't rest, rest until
until it comes. Oh, until the killing of black men, black mother sons, is the same as the killing of white men, white mother sons. Oh, we who believe in freedom. Myself don't mean a whole lot. I've come to realize, but teaching others to stand up and fight is the only way my struggle survives. Oh, we who believe in free, who believe in free, will not rest. No, we who believe. Until it comes, oh, we who believe, oh, we who believe in freedom will not rest. No, we who believe in freedom will not rest until it comes. That was Ella's song, one of the beautiful songs from the movement. And while we're talking about beautiful songs, maybe some of y'all noticed that at the beginning of this day, Karen shared a beautiful song, but we didn't sing it with her. So we are going to sing that song for her and for y'all today. So we're gonna sing A Change Is Gonna Come. But, but first, we wanna ask you all a question. So that while we sing you this song, we want to be hearing from you. Because it was always our plan to interact with you. And even though we're, we have screens mediating it, we want to know your responses to this question. Um, there's a question you may see on your screen right now. Can we put the slide up? The question we want, we want you to think about is, during the last two years, during this challenging time, what is a resource that you found, a strength you tapped into, or something important you discovered about yourself? Another way of saying this would be, what did you learn? What is something that you learned over this period of time? And just to be fair about it, we have to answer the question ourselves. Um, so I wondered if we could maybe just go down the line. Michelle, what did you learn during these last two years? Yeah, I learned, um, I'm going to paraphrase Asada Shakur, which is that revolution is not romance, it is a science. So that's something that I've learned in the last 18 plus months. <laughs> yeah. Laurie? I learned... Um, that I really like myself and my family more than I thought I did. And I learned that I am so blessed and grateful to have been locked up in a room with them because we got a chance to love on each other and, and to be with each other and to, to not run around, but to just love each other there, so. What about you, Franklin? Um, I definitely learned more about uh, listening to my body. Um, and really being in tune to literally the energy levels I've had or the amount of time I had ample in a day. And one of the great quotes that Michelle actually gave me earlier today is um, time doesn't mean availability, right? And so letting my body rest. So shout out to Michelle for that one too. That was in recent days, minutes. Um, hi, I'm Ryan. I, uh, what, I learned that I care about my family more than anything else. 
like all of the dreams, the aspirations, the wanting to be famous, the having money, the doing the things I think the world needs to be fixed, doesn't mean nothing compared to my family. I love my wife and baby. Shout out. Uh, you're the best. I learned that in the midst of great sickness, there's many different types of illness. And yes, they all need to be addressed because to not address them means that we are unhealthy. So from societal ills to personal ills, while we may have to create a strategy of how we prioritize them, they all need to be addressed for us to be whole. What about you? I learned that Lurie's front yard <laughs> is better than any concert venue in town because she invited us all to make music for people who are standing in the street and standing across the street at a safe distance and it fed my soul, it fed everyone's soul and we were so grateful for that venue. Um, one thing I learned during the recent closeness um, was how imperfect love is and it's wonderful <laughs> and it's healthy and it's healing and it's strengthening and the best thing you can do for yourself is to spread it without restraint. Mm. And it's free. It's free. So if you're cheap like me, just produce some love. It costs you nothing. So we want to invite you to share in the chat what you learned. Um, we'd love to see it. We'd love to know. We'd love for you to share it with everybody else who's watching the chat and who's here with us today. And Karen, is it okay if we uh, do a little bit of a reinvention of song you mentioned this morning. All right. As the song starts, I want to mention that every human being on this stage is a lighthouse, a place where light has gathered to show those in the darkness what needs to be seen and that everyone here on this stage is a microphone, is a tower of power that shares what our community needs and wants. I'm honored to be here with them because I know a change gonna come. myself in the ample space and time that God gave me I finally heard the voice that one I'd been searching through through all the buys through all the capitalism by the time my teeth started to sing everyone in the community was singing with me by the time my soul started to sing even the trees started to sing with me by the time we were all in unison you could finally see the blue clear sky once all the pollution had cleared out it took us all sitting down in our own stillness in our own bodies, in our own selves, in our own moment to really own ourselves, own this life, own this moment, this blessing, this transparency, this commitment, this accountability, this transformation. It was all ours to begin with. And nobody ever had to give you permission to be yourself. And that was one of the most blessing things I'd learned during quarantine.
rise together, we rise together, we rise together, we raise up. Whatever the days are brought in every phase, we're setting the stage up with memories of better ways of breaking bread with neighbors. And when I share with you, it's an honor, not a favor. Everybody gets a stranger in a strange land till we make plans to be otherwise. Raise hands up to the skies like water vapors that arise from the cold streets like butterflies or break dancers doing boomerangs coming back home to one great family of human beings. Look into each other's eyes, see a whole world of a size only the most high could know. Dreams of a dozen lifetimes, blood, blood lines flowing right below the patchwork tapestry that we call skin, we call relatives like lightning bolts. An ocean from an icicle. So whenever my eyes are closed, I'm praying we can keep love alive. Clutch tight to the rainbows, to the sunsets and the northern lights, to the flesh tones spanning every shade of luscious bright dust that provides us sustenance. Please don't ever let me be colorblind. Sing a lullaby. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. in Denver, Colorado, stroller in my baby through the beautiful sunlight. And as I saw through the trees, the sunlight and the shade, I saw two people getting out of a compost truck helping an old lady. And I thought, Utopia is not that far away. It ain't that hard for us to get what we need if we work together. You see, Mark Lechman from the University of Oregon found out if you take 300 random people and you put them in a circle and at the middle you put what they need, it turns out it's already there. You see, somewhere in your neighborhood is a carpenter, is a dance instructor, is someone who can turn your garden into food, someone who can teach you how to renovate your house. Everything you need is around you. It's each other. It's us. We just have to work together. We just have to be brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers to each other. We just gotta believe that a change gonna come. Shout down Babylon and call out the Pontius Pilots. This is domestic violence. Witness our best and brightest silence. It's time to shake it off and start an antifada. Fathers, daughters, mother, sons, we need a new tomorrow. When we fill the streets, you can hear my people call. Sing it, 
sister. We've got another that says, beautiful voice, Karen, that was inspiration. After many of the other ones, we've got some other I picked out. One, Alexis Romero Stewart said, I feel that. It's so important to slow down and realize what we're fully feeling before we can face it. Thank you so much. Some of the, uh, the songs that came out, Amazing Grace, The Rose, A Beautiful Day by India R.E., some things people learn and want to share, that fear is a liar, that they can overcome, that white saviorism is not needed ever, that they can help their homies preach, that until you see my struggle as your struggle, you can go home. So if you commented, if you're a part of this community, thank you. these human beings because they deserve the specific love. Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask first, just like a thunderous round of applause in this audience after each name, please. First, Chrissy G, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, very talented, so good. Johnny Five, yeah. Br'er Rabbit, absolutely. Franklin Cruz, Lady Lurie. Michelle Rocket, I... Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Ryan Fu, yes. Th yeah. Thank you all so much for being with us. Big thank you to Infinity Park and everyone here at the symposium. We love you. We appreciate you. Please be well and have yourself a good night. Oh, we you things? Oh, no. Oh, we're leaving this on. I'm, I apologize. That's on me. Thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you all. That was incredible. What a great send-off. That concludes day one. I hope that wherever you joined us from across the state of Colorado, you found a moment of connection, a moment of joy, a moment of rejuvenation, and we will see you bright and early tomorrow morning at 8.30. Have a great evening. Thank you guys so much.